Why do we love other people's stories? That's a very interesting question. Uh, I think we're drawn to other people's stories because we get tired of our own. I think we're narrative beings and that in so many ways we, who we take ourselves to be is really who we are cast in the story that we fabricate, that we created at a very early age unconsciously. You know, perhaps the family we're born into and a whole narrative gets created that gives us, I think, the reassurance that we know who we are. Uh, but unfortunately for most of us, I think the stories that we inherit don't generally lead to happiness. And I think that uh, the fascination we have in stories of any kind is we'd like to see alternative stories, certainly alternative endings generally, and we'd like to be able to reconsider the stories that we've told about ourselves. Do you think that's why some of us just love the, the dark cinema, going into a movie theater, because we're almost able to get out of our own mm -hmm. body. It's like an outer body experience because we're then going to live life through someone else. That's a, that's a very interesting comment. Yeah, I think there's something about the darkness uh, which in a funny way allows us not to be seen. So much of our lives we want to be seen. So much of our motivation is to be seen, is to felt, is to feel that we've been seen. And yet we can be, we can be imprisoned by uh, often what we project others see in us, you know, our darkest fears. So I think there's a great uh, liberating quality to going into a darkened cinema where you're not going to be seen. And you can perhaps then maybe feel greater freedom to give vent to your full, uh, you know, the full expression of your feeling life. What makes you such a good storyteller? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for saying that. Uh, I think I'm a good storyteller when I'm invested in the story I'm telling. When I'm truly curious about finding a meaning within it or a thread to follow that I am truly curious about. And that, and that permits me, it makes me better able to make discoveries within myself. I also find that uh, as a storyteller, I have to stay, part, part of me is, the, is of course the one telling the story, but another part of me always has to be the audience as well because I, have to, I want to be experiencing the story as I'm telling it because that's the best barometer I have to how it's going to be experienced by the audience. Uh, so I'm constantly assessing, or I try to, what would make this interesting to me? And, uh, you know, I think the stories that I tell at work are when I've succeeded at, at, that, at finding those things. A little bit of a quote here. A story is more than simply what happens. Mm -hmm. It includes the meaning of what happens. Yeah. I don't think it's acknowledged enough um, how much the director in any format, feature or series television, even working on an existing show, how much uh, responsibility really the director has and power to define what the story is. Because as you pointed out, as I mentioned in my book, uh, a story is not simply what happens, it's the meaning of what happens. It's, it's, as the director, you can uh, acquaint, you can define what is at issue. You can uh, help generate the subjective states that are required for moments in a story best to land in an audience. And what a story is about uh, really is determined by so many other factors uh, in addition to what happens. It's, it's the intentions of the characters who are performing the actions. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's understanding what strategies are being employed by the characters. Uh, and I'm always interested when those strategies fail. That to me is when the real story has a chance, a deeper story has a chance to be unearthed because that's when you get an opportunity to see how, imagine anyway, how real human beings react authentically. That's something I'm always after, authenticity. The one thing that, that I can't tolerate is when I feel something is fake or inauthentic uh, because that doesn't speak to us as it doesn't, it doesn't invite us to come alive ourselves. I often think of stories as uh, storytelling as in film and television as making the written word come alive. 
And I think in so many ways, I notice within myself, I often you know, feel I go through life in many situations dulled and kind of self-protective and presenting a persona to the world and not really being fully present. What I love about directing is in many ways, uh, it's a little funny to be saying this, but in many ways I feel most alive, most present when I'm telling a story and working with actors and working with the, you know, the cameraman or woman to really uh, uh, find the truth and the depth of a story because I'm fully attuned, I have to be, to what's happening within me. Am I feeling stimulated? Am I feeling intrigued? Am I feeling uninterested? Which generally is when I realize more digging is needed. This is when I have to go in and, and help the actors find a richer inner life or a richer subtext or a richer dynamic between the characters. Well, and that's a great point that you made earlier about like inauthenticity and we all wear masks, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and we wear them in different situations. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the beauty of cinema as well is that we can kind of take off our mask for a moment yeah. and watch whether it's someone else's mask or a mask they're trying to not wear, whatever it is, and, and, and rest our own for a little yeah. bit. You're reminding me of a story uh, that I uh, recount in my book. I have a, a, uh, a chapter on the sh directing the show Homeland. Oh, great. And uh, while I directed many of episodes of that series and some more high profile than the one I'm, I wrote about, what really interested me in this particular one is that it was, uh, it, w it, it was an episode that kind of departed from the high stakes international drama and focused on a custody trial for uh, uh, Carrie Mathis and Claire Dane's character uh, battling with her sister, who uh, for, for several seasons had kind of been adversarial uh, with uh, Carrie uh, over how to parent Carrie's child. And so it comes to a head in this trial, and in it, uh, Carrie arrives at the understanding that she's going, she voluntarily relinquishes custody to her sister, uh, despite the fact that there's no one in the world she loves more than this child. So that's a huge transition that she would have to make. And the writers uh, wrote it in a way that uh, gave me very little to work with because, you, because uh, it, it, they wanted Carrie not to have any cross-examination or call any witnesses. It was simply a litany of people coming to the stand, attacking her as a parent. And uh, my job as the director was to make this a compelling courtroom sequence. And there needs drama, there needs opposition, there needs not someone who's not just uh, folding her tent at the beginning of the, the sequence and then getting piled on for the whole time. So I had to kind of figure out ways to uh, have, I, I knew what the ending had to be. Carrie had to arrive at this understanding. Uh, but I had to figure out ways for the audience to be cued that she was still fighting for her for her custody of her child. But the key moment the writers had had uh, told me they thought was the turning point for her was when her sister calls her a hero. And despite the fact that they'd been you know fighting tooth and nail for several seasons over the treatment of her daughter, and particularly in this courtroom trial, there's something rang inauthentic about that. I thought, why would Carrie? Uh, simply be, by being called a hero by her sister, agree to turn over her child. It felt to me uh, that a more honest response from someone in her position, and again, that goes to consulting my own feelings. Would I make a momentous turn like that if, if someone who was about to take from me the person I cared most for in the world, if they simply called me a hero, why wouldn't I just think of that as simply a bone they were throwing to me to assuage their own guilt for what they were doing? Why would I give it credibility? So I was struggling with this question of how to make something feel credible. And what the writers had told me didn't feel sufficient enough. So I embarked on a kind of uh, difficult exploration about uh, you know, what could make this authentic, and I couldn't get a rewrite. The rewrite might have addressed it if I, if I asked for a different dynamic happening. But they were insistent, no, we don't want this to, uh, we want it to be just, just as it is. So it was, became my job to make it feel, uh, feel authentic. And you know, there's a quote, I wish I could Yeah, oh please, you see it. your book yeah. here. Yeah. yeah, I do, I'm gonna get my, Here's my book, oh. Directing Great oh, Television, wow. okay. Inside Very TV's beautiful. New Golden Age. So this issue of how to make the uh, 
moment credible uh, brought me to, to this realization, and I wrote about it in my book. In a story, you can want specific things to happen. You can say that they happen, and you, and you can do your best to justify why they happen. But that's not the same as creating the feeling that they credibly have happened. Bad drama is filled with false moments in which characters go through transformations that have not been earned with false insights and false feelings ramrodding the story along. In some ways, well, I can go on, but I mean, that's, that's the, the key point to me is it's like, yeah, you can say, well, this happened. This is an example of the earlier question you asked about, you know, what is a story? You can say a story, well, the story is this. But if the audience isn't taken with you, if they don't have the feeling that something has happened, not simply that you've told them that it's happened or you see that it happens, you have to have the feeling that it's justified, that it's, that it's honoring the truth of the story and that it's a natural outgrowth and an interesting development you know, within the story. So uh, what I realized, let me see, I think there's some more. Oh yeah, so, so I was struck with this difficulty of how to justify uh, Claire Danes uh, playing Carrie Matheson, her turn. And, uh, and I wrote this, which I, th I think is the th passage I'm looking for. Moments of reckoning that have moved me, either in life or in great storytelling, have taught me that transformation has a chance to occur when people honestly confront something about themselves that they've been unaware of or strenuously denying when they give up their own failed strategies or self-deceptions, it can feel like a death. Transformation starts with being willing to admit to painful truths, which can break through our fixed ideas about ourselves and our defenses keeping them intact. The possibility for grace to appear, giving, the possibility arises for grace to appear, giving us a fuller awareness of and forgiveness for who we really are. Dramatizing this, to me, is the height of great storytelling, and transformation is probably the most personally meaningful theme I am drawn to explore in any story. Uh, well, I can continue, Excellent. or I could just kind of say that what, what occurred to me, um, well, I'll read it. For this Homeland episode, the writers demonstrated a similar understanding in how they described Carrie's journey. She finally sees how unfit she's been as a parent, and this painful reckoning leads her to do the right thing for her daughter. But it was not landing for me, nor would it, I imagined, for the audience. In thinking of, and so I'll then relay what I continue to write about. So, I, so the, the, the centerpiece of the courtroom drama was going to be the sister, whose character's name was Maggie, uh, when she gets up and gives her testimony, and this is what the writers had thought, okay, she's going to call her a hero, and it's going to magically change Carrie's attitude towards her sister. And, uh, and I, for the reasons I expressed earlier, I didn't think that would land for the audience. I thought Carrie would say, yeah, right, you're piling on, you're taking from me the, big, the most important person in my life, and you're telling me I'm a hero and I'm supposed to fold. I don't think so, I'm not that simple. Or as Hamlet says, uh, said with the flute player, I says, how do you think you can play me as easily as you play that flute? Uh, so I started to think, what would move me? If I were in Carrie's shoes, and that's really what I do as a director, I have to do. I have to kind of put myself in each of these characters' positions so that I can consult myself. I have to be my own barometer for what I think works. That's the only chance I have to communicate. I have to assume that if it affects me, there's a chance it's going to affect the audience. So uh, it struck me that I was thinking of the story incorrectly. And this goes to the other fascinating thing about storytelling is defining the story. It's not simply, it's not just a story about uh, Carrie giving up custody of her child. It's also could be defined as the story of the, a rapprochement between two sisters, a coming together of two sisters. And how would that be? And that goes to the point I tried to make when I was writing about transformation, how you have to have a painful reckoning. So I thought, <clears throat> if I were in Claire Danes Carey's position in the court, what would move me would be if I saw that my sister testifying was going through almost as difficult a reckoning as I was being asked to go through in giving up my daughter. And I started to realize maybe my focus has been wrong. Maybe, maybe the focus should be on the sister's testimony 
And I started to look at it, and I realized that there was an opportunity here to give her an entirely new subtext that I thought would bring about the desired result. And in the testimony, she gets up and she continues to pile on. You know, she says, yes, she did this terrible thing, and she did that terrible thing. And then she asked the judge, may I just deliver a few uh, uh, remarks? And the judge says, yes. And this was all written. Not a word of the script was changed. And she looks at what she'd written, and then she puts it down. And she says, may I just speak to her directly? And the judge says, okay. And she begins to recount their history. And she says, you know, when, when I was young and you, you know, you were, you were always, you know, you were the star of the family. You were very talented. And I, I envied you, frankly. And, you know, I, I admired you, but I also, you know, felt less than you. Uh, and, you know, you, you're a hero. You do many things I could never do. But, you know, there are other things more, there are other things besides being a hero. And she goes on to, you know, and how I'd understood that from the tone meeting with the writers was, well, she's just trying to de-escalate. She's trying to kind of, you know, say, look, this isn't personal. You know, we were sisters and we had a life and I, I don't hate you. In fact, I think you're pretty great in many ways, but you're not a great parent. And I thought that that was what was not working, coming in with that intention, with that subtext. So I started to think, well, what if Maggie has to go through as painful an inner reckoning as we're asking Carrie to do? What if, and this is what occurred to me, what if she's never before admitted? What if this wound she describes is current? What if she still feels inferior to her sister? What if it's the most painful thing in her life to acknowledge that she's always felt inferior, that she wasn't loved as much as Carrie, and that she's never before admitted it for fear of really coming to touch that deficiency? And what I thought was wonderful about that was uh, it also kind of accounted for previous season's behavior because she was always, I always felt in these scenes, a little sanctimonious with Mag, with Carrie. Carrie was off doing these amazing things, you know, preventing the next, you know, World Trade Center event. And she's being, but you weren't there for your daughter, you know? And so there was a little, there was something a little off. And, uh, and so I, I, then I had, then went further thinking, well, okay, so why, why would she be motivated to say this precisely now? Why would she in this public setting, and that, that's also what makes it more poignant, is in this public setting, she was admitting something she'd never before admitted to anyone, including her husband, including Carrie. She, and so if she gave it that subtext, it would, if it was filled with that much pain and angst and sense of inner deficiency to say, this is who I am, I feel nothing around you, why would she do that then? And, I, and the answer, again, it's a series of directing for me is so much a matter of inquiry, of asking questions, and then your inner resources can come and answer. And, and what was coming to me was, well, uh, she's doing, this may be her last chance to ever talk to her sister. She's taking away her daughter. This may be the only form her sister will ever give to her. And if at some future time, and she knows she's doing it for good reasons because this child is suffering, but if at some future time, some imagined future, it came out, Carrie learned that she, her sister really did harbor this resentment and even hatred of her sister and as a child that was still carrying through, it would cast this proceeding in an abhorrent light. It would, make, it would give Carrie the opportunity of interpreting what happened as a selfish act, as someone who was just trying to get back. And that's not why she was doing this. She was doing it she was acting from her best self in trying to save this child. And, if she, and so she needs to come clean. She needs to take this public setting to come clean. This is who I am. I'm acknowledging it. And I'm acknowledging it now so you understand that's not why I'm doing this. I'm hurting myself in saying this. But I'm still convinced that this child will suffer if you don't give up custody to me. And... Uh, that opened up the whole scene so that I understood, well, Carrie's transformation, I can believe, she, the, the sister will win credibility with Carrie if Carrie gets to watch with us as the audience this painful inner reckoning that Maggie goes through. And then, just to conclude this, so what was the moment of transformation? It, it's not that she, tell, she tells Carrie she always thought she was a hero. It's the credibility that she wins in making this personal confession that opens Carrie to hear the next thing she says. 
which is to tell her, you are a hero, you are motivated by, you know, the, the, uh, uh, your destiny is to do what you do. So I know now you're saying you're going to be a better parent. I know now you're saying you will not ever, you know, betray, you know, your daughter in any way. But how can you know that? Isn't it more true? Isn't it more true to say that the next time a world crisis happens, you won't be able to resist? Isn't it true that the record shows that? Can't you acknowledge that, that you're going to wound her again just in the same way you've heard all these witnesses testify the many ways she has been wounded, even though your intentions now are good? Isn't it inevitable you will? And because Carrie can now accept that as true, as coming from an authentic place, it permits her to open, drop her own defenses against her sister and see the truth of it and make the transformation. It's emotional for me recounting that and uh, because to me it, it got to a level of, of cracking open a deeper layer of what happens between human beings, what's true human behavior and what, and, and, and obviously all human behavior is true in a certain sense and that human beings are capable and they're doing it, but when they're acting out of defenses, when they're acting out of self-protection, out of strategizing, it's a different order of authenticity. What's the core below that? That's what I'm always thirsting for. That's what it gives me such joy when we can reach that place in directing anything. And I think there's so many more opportunities than, you know, people may think when even coming into, I mean, my career is basically directing existing franchises, coming into stories that are already kind of, you know, structured and shaped and characters are kind of in place. But there's always, I always regard it as an opportunity. Okay, but let's look at this the unique circumstances of this particular episode of this particular situation and what would make me compelled by what's going on. It's not changing anything necessarily in the, other than the fact that it's deepening. It's not, I don't have to change characters back, uh, you know, situations, but I can go deeper into it, which reminds me of another story, which is uh, when I was an actor or studying to be an actor. I, I, I arrived at, uh, I was an English major as an undergraduate, I got into law school, I didn't know really what I wanted to do. I knew uh, after I got accepted and went through the, that, all, all that mishigas, I realized I, this is not for me, I'm, I'm not going to enroll in that and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I started, I gravitated towards a, taking some acting classes because I did enjoy drama, I was an English major, I liked story. And I felt it would help free me from some of the constrictions of these personas we carry around and these, these defenses we erect and the ways in which I felt uh, uh, not fully present in my life. And I thought, well, let me act. Let me, let, me, let me try playing with imaginary circumstances. And I loved it. And I did it for about three years studying acting. Uh, I ultimately found that my talents, were, I feel, are much better suited to direct because I had a harder time getting out of my own way as an actor. It was kind of hard to have the scrutiny on me at this moment. What am I feeling right now? And a, and a strong critical voice kind of saying, oh, this isn't real and, and having to overcome all that. What was interesting, so I realized as a director, I was better able to get, am better able to get out of my own way. And frankly, I'm a better actor when I'm working with direct, with actors who are really talented uh, because I'm not, I don't feel personally on the line and I feel more able to access that. So while I uh, did become a director as opposed to an actor, my experience acting uh, was probably the most helpful thing I ever did in, in preparing me to direct because I understood how an actor has to think, what would be helpful for an actor to hear uh, and what would be destructive, what would, what would not assist someone access, to access their deeper resources. But while I was acting, uh, I had a few teachers. One was a great teacher uh, named Jeff Corey, who was a blacklisted actor who then uh, opened shop in Los Angeles. He, he taught Jack Nicholson, among others, very talented. But over the summer, since I was on the West Coast, I would take uh, classes from Stella Adler, who would come in the summers and offer her workshops. And Stella was, uh, her most famous pupil is Marlon Brando. She was a, is a, was a superstar among, among acting teachers. And she left the group theater in the 1930s because of its emphasis on naturalistic acting. It, you know, because of its emphasis on always finding, relating any situation to a particular incident in your own life. It didn't, it didn't invite the imagination as much as she thought 
the, you know, people can, our imaginations are treasure chests and we don't, we shouldn't restrict ourselves to always having to be natural. And she, she, would, she would say to the actors gathered around, uh, she would say, you know, um, being natural is important, but it's not everything. And one thing she would do is she'd, she'd stand up in front of, she's a beautiful statuesque, very imposing woman, and she'd get up there and she'd kind of slouch. And then she'd pretend she's smoking a cigarette. She'd, you know, and she'd say, is this, is this very good? It's, it's natural, isn't it? You know? She say nat being natural is is just a start, and it's like sometimes actors will use being natural as an as an excuse for not diving deeper into what their inner character's inner life is. And what she said, and this has been a great lesson for me as a director, uh, is she, she was talking to actors, but it applies to all of us as storytellers. She would tell actors as give your characters as rich an inner life as you possibly can. Make their concerns large. Make their, their inner issues big, you know? So, so, and that goes again to defining story. It's like, what is, a, what is a human being, a character, really concerned with? You know, it's easy to kind of, you know, find, you, you can justify uh, an action or a, a dynamic within a scene in an, an almost infinite number of ways, but what would be compelling to you? What would be, I, that's the question I'm asking when I read a script or watch a scene in rehearsal. What would make this compelling to me? Who would these characters, not just who would these characters have to be, what are the issues? What are the issues in their lives that are active within them? What are they trying to get that isn't just simple, as simple as hitting on a woman and getting a date? Why? I mean, what's, you know, it's like, what do they want for their lives? And how does that, how does that advance it in some way? Yes, the dialogue can be the same. I mean, an example I cite in the book just came to me was, you know, a, a a mother uh, with a with a with a young person, a, a young man as a son who's kind of back at home and just kind of not doing anything with his life and is sleeping in and making a mess around the house, and she's having to pick up after him all the time. Well, imagine dialogue between those two characters where the mother might choose the subtext, well, the intention. You know, I want him to pick. I don't want. I'm tired of picking up after him, and I want him to, you know, lighten my load and you know, pull your weight around here. And he could, she could use that as her subtext and say those lines, and that's natural, that's justifiable, that makes sense. But how much would we care about her or her son? Not, not a great deal, because that's not a very big intention. If you gave her this, the inner life, the intention of something along the lines of, I brought you into this world. I think this world is in trouble. I'm concerned about this world. You know, too many people are just looking out for themselves, and we're losing, a, we're losing all of our sense of community and helping each other. And it's like, if you, if, you, if you don't take responsibility for yourself, if you don't find it an, a, a prior, if you don't make it a priority not to make others clean up after you, what kind of person are you going to be going in the world? You may prevent others from thriving because of your, you know, shirking your own responsibilities and you're better than that. Well, you wouldn't have to change a word of dialogue, but if those were the subtexts going on between the two characters, I, I would personally be a lot more interested in both of them, and I think the audience would as well. And they would have been cued to another story that you, as the director, had a great had a great power to influence. I wonder if we can just go back to the homeland yeah. uh, courtroom scene. So I'm fascinated by this, and and I'd actually like to go and and now I, I want to definitely watch this oh, and, and and dissect good. it. Um, so I understand that the dialogue was not changed. Not a bit. Okay, so then you took both actresses. Oh, oh yeah, let me tell you more about yeah, that. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's interesting that I hit upon this new way of conceiving the scene only the night before we were supposed to film it. And we were already halfway through filming the entire courtroom sequence. Uh, I should say in advance of even getting to the courtroom sequence, because I was concerned of about keeping maintaining audience interest in this trial when all that was written was a bunch of negative witnesses kind of pointing the finger at Claire Danes. And I was concerned, well, we have to understand that she still feels, it wants to win. We have to make the audience not assume she's gonna lose from the get-go. So how can, how can, what can I help Claire with in terms of her performance, her intention, not simply, it, because for the writers, it's almost as if what they were saying was, she's hearing all these things and she's taking them all in. Oh, I've really been a bad parent. 
and the reason she could take them in, this was another uh, interesting element of the script. <clears throat> At the beginning of the episode, she's just come out of electroshock therapy because she's had a bipolar episode that led to manic behavior. They gave her electroshock therapy and now at this trial she's been essentially dulled in a certain way. She's, not, she's no longer the driven character that might be so reactive to people saying, you know, you really didn't do very well that time with Franny, the name of the daughter. Whereas, whereas without the electroshock therapy, perhaps she would get defensive. <clears throat> they thought this was an opportunity where Claire Danes could carry, could be more receptive and hear it as if so that she'd be hearing this as if for the first time. Oh, I did do that. Oh, I, so that was what they thought was the story, was constantly hearing, oh yeah, I did that. Oh, I did that. Oh, boy, I did that too. Okay, take my child. And I thought that was not very good drama and very good storytelling and, and I, I thought we'd lose the audience. So in advance of finding this new way for the sister to play the part, I had, <clears throat> I had come up with the only thing that I thought could possibly maintain interest, which is that Claire would be hearing all these things, taking them in, but with the conviction that, si that no one could possibly love this child any more than her and that she's now finally hearing it will ensure that she'll be, do a better job as a parent. So that would be a way she could, you know, the audience might understand, oh, she still wants to win. But there was no dialogue to support that. So I thought all of that would have to be conveyed by Claire just by the way she was listening. So it was a difficult intention. So I set up a pre-production meeting with Claire Danes, which is not in television, it's a rare thing to do. You know, these actors are, you know, certainly the leads are generally so skilled and Claire Danes is one of the consummate actresses in the world. Uh, I wanted her to have a, an idea of what, how I thought she should approach preparing for the part. So we met for coffee during my prep period and I explained the dilemma which she fully understood and I said, so I think what would be great is as you're hearing this testimony, we want the sense that it's going in, that you're hearing it in a new way because of this alteration of your brain, but that you're also equally convinced that it's going to make you a better parent, not that you should give her up. So she thought, she said, okay, I'll do that. And so, but I wanted to acquaint her with this way of playing it, not just spring it on her when we show up to film. Uh, but I knew also that uh, to support both Claire and the audience understanding it, I'd have to contextualize what was happening because all, all Claire would have to convey any of this would be like looks and facial expressions and no cross-examination and no, I mean, I, I even filmed, I filmed in a, a moment where she leaned over to the, her own lawyer and her lawyer interrupted with a question that showed she was fighting, but I just filmed it in case they saw my point later, but they didn't want to include that. Uh, so I had to figure out ways. So, so other things in the filming I did is like, well, let's give her a notepad and let's, as she's hearing things, maybe she's hearing that and she writes something down as if that's something she's gonna ask her later. But in any case, I prepared Claire for the difficult challenge she faced, still not satisfied that that would be enough. And so the night before the sister's testimony is when I had this kind of epiphany of how I thought the scene might really work. And again, I realized that's not something I can spring on the actress, an actress named Amy Hargreaves, an excellent actress who played uh, Maggie, uh, the sister. And she was gonna testify the next afternoon. That's when we would film it. So I called her up and I said, you know, I've just had this new insight into how I think this scene would work and I'd like to share it with you. And I shared with her this whole new approach to her character. And it was daunting and it was asking her to go far deeper into herself and to make herself vulnerable in a way that uh, A, she probably wasn't even thinking of because she was in a battle mode. She, as the adversary in this courtroom, she was gonna go in and kind of, you know, uh, kick ass and take names or whatever they say. And uh, so I was saying, no, that's not what this is gonna be about. It's gonna be about you facing your own sense of deficiency publicly. And she loved it because it gave me, she was concerned because she'd have to do some of that work that night. But as any good actor does, they, they relish an opportunity to go deeper. That's why they, I think the best actors are in it 
And that's why I'm in it. That's why, you know, it's like we want to crack open something deeper within ourselves and get to experience it. Because life has its own complications. There's a lot of things you need to keep defenses in place for. But in, in the imagine, the world of the imagination and plays and drama it goes to your question about why we go see stories, why we want to see them. We get to see things happen that, uh, you know, don't happen so easily in life. And, and so, so she did the preparation and she came in the next day and was brilliant. And I should say that for anybody who looks at the episode, I don't know how much of this would really land. I think people will feel, oh yeah, that made sense, what happened. But what's also interesting to me is about this story is <clears throat> I realize that there's a large section of the fan base of Homeland who really would regard this as kind of not one of their highlight episodes because it doesn't deal with international intrigue or mortal peril or you know, all these exciting things. It's simply, a, a, a sense, a domestic drama. Uh, but to me, it was one of, and I've done some episodes that fit that bill. I did one on the fourth season called 13 Hours in Islamabad, which was the overtaking of the American embassy in Pakistan. And it was one of the most exciting shows, I think, of the whole series. That gets a lot of attention. This was just a little custody trial, but I get so much pleasure knowing that uh, the work that went in and the depth that we were able to reach uh, and making a moment real. And that's what I think is the director's job. And all and you know, all of us together, but the director is the final arbiter. Is the director is the one who's in charge of assessing moment to moment how the story is being told and when it's at its best best form. And so I take a, a lot of inner satisfaction from the, that particular sequence. So the writers of Homeland, they didn't want to change it or it just, they felt that the way it was written was fine, the two sisters? Well, this, this opens up a lot of questions which I think are really f features of collaborative creativity that I find fascinating. They had written the script and felt good about it. They thought it worked in a certain way and they, they told me the way they thought it worked. Uh, but it's so interesting, you know, in features generally, I think in general terms, in features, the director is more the one empowered to kind of make a lot of the creative decisions. In series television, it's weighted much more towards the writer and the showrunner so that, so that the interesting challenge in coming into a series is I have to be serving the vision of the showrunner. I can't change that. That's not, that's not my place. But I can bring, but, but, but what's interesting is that uh, the writer has to, uh, would be better off, I think, if they acknowledge, we'll certainly get greater creative contributions from others if they acknowledge that their work has to be interpreted. A script is really a fleshless blueprint when you think about it. It's words on a page. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I say in the book, it's like there's no such thing as filming the script. That would be pictures of words on a page. You have to, you know, you have to interpret it. You have to give the actors have to bring their understanding of what's going on. You have to dig deep for the kinds of inner life and subtext and intentions that I've been describing. Um, and it's not really the writer's, the writer delivers a script that they felt good about, which is in, in this case they did, and, and, and it turned out to be great. Now, I gave it a subtext and an inner life that they hadn't imagined, but what fascinates me is I wouldn't have arrived at my understanding of what the scene could be if the script had been written any differently. I looked at the speech Maggie gives and she references her pain from childhood. And that was a way that my experience in life, my understanding of how human beings work, led me to bring my, again, bring my own experience to it, to ask the question, to explore myself what those kind of issues and words evoked. And they evoked in me the possibility that that may not just be in the past, it might be now also. So without a word changing, I came to that understanding and it was a clue embedded in the dialogue itself, which the writers did not, con did not consider consciously was even there. But I'm, I believe, and there's another chapter I write on the, uh, an episode of The Americans, uh, where a, a very similar total transformation happened without changing a word. In that chapter I call rewriting the subtext. Um, the Homeland chapter I call making meaning, which is really what I felt I was doing. Uh, it's, not, it's not the writer's job to tell the director how to make the story most, the most compelling it can be. The writer provides a script that they feel good about. That's what these writers did. It's my job to interpret it and to 
translate it in a way that feels pers that feels meaningful to me that I believe the audience is going to uh, respond to. Uh, so that's one thing I really value about series television directing is the limitations I'm given because you know it's like it's like in it, like a feature with unlimited budget if you can't do something it's easy to solve a problem by throwing money at it or giving more days to shoot or whatever but when you have limitations often that can inspire creative solutions because you you know it was sometimes we take the path of least resistance well the only way to do that is to shoot two extra days or you know to have a thousand extra extras or whatever you know but wait you can't oh so how can i solve it another way uh, there's a story I tell in the book too, it may be apocryphal, but I, uh, it's funny, I was an assistant director for Francis Coppola, but this is a story about Francis that I'd heard that, you know, there's a, an, in Godfather 2, when young Vito comes to Ellis Island, uh, there's a very iconic shot of, uh, well, before I tell about that shot, uh, the story anyway is that Francis wanted to film uh, build a set that would be for Ellis Island that would somewhere look out on the Statue of Liberty so that you could have young Vito staring out at the Statue of Liberty. Well, that was impossible and the budget didn't allow for it. So the solution that they came up with was to have young Vito come to the window and stare out and in the glass there was a reflection of the Statue of Liberty which was a picture of the Statue of Liberty, <laughs> a backing, you know. And that was a beautiful poetic image. You united in one image the Statue of Liberty and the face of young Vito. And it's like, you know, if he could have just thrown money at it and just done it that way, he would have told the story, but it wouldn't have had that, he wouldn't have had that poetic, that poetic shot. So, so it, it, all of this points to, to me the fascinating collaborative quality that we all bring our own talents, we all bring our own ways of seeing. I feel this way when an actor shows me something I never would have imagined. You know, an actor, I've had experiences where, you know, I've fully prepped, I believe in that tremendously, how important it is for a director to really explore as much as you can and prep to really find out all the nuances you think are there, to figure out a staging, which I, I prefer not to impose. I like the actors to find it, but I, but if, but I will tend to, you know, I will want to make sure the staging is going to be something that tells the story in behavior as well as in the dialogue. So I can help guide the, the, the actors to finding that, or if I have to, if, t if there are time constraints and I have to impose a staging right away, I can do it. I have it in my in my you know. So I, I you know, I think being fully prepared. Some some directors actually think, well, no, I want to be creative in the moment. I find I can be so much more creative in the moment the more prepared I am, because I've thought about what uh, what is the key moment, what is the issue here. And I've come up with a solution to bring that about, but if someone comes up with a better solution and I can plug, oh, and I understand how that will, that will enhance this other moment, will actually deepen the meaning, I can employ it, I can use it, I can incorporate it. Um, so all of this is to say, I guess, that I, I so value uh, the collaboration that filmmaking entails. And as far as the writers not, you know, they're within their rights not to change the script. They've, you know, that they're performing their function. Uh, if you're not a particularly talented writer, you may hamstring your collaborators in ways that are unfortunate. But in this case, I had very talented writers, Alex Gonza and Ron Nicewaner, I think was the writer for this particular episode. Uh, it, it, they were tapping into a part of their unconscious, I would say, which is really where creativity originates. And even though they weren't necessarily conscious of the possibilities they, they you know, revealed to me, I, from my own experience, was able to discern what I wanted to do with it. And how much do you consider the audience, especially for, let's say, a show like Homeland where you yeah. said there were other uh, episodes where that was really what the audience wanted, you yeah. know, kind of... Yeah, you know, um, yeah, another really interesting fact, element to me of series directing is coming in as a director, one has to respect the audience's prior experience and their set of expectations. So that can manifest in several ways, one of which is, say, the, the visual language. You know, uh, you know, I'm sure 
everyone's favorite show has a particular way of photographing things. I can remember in the, I guess it was the nine, 1990s, how it, NYPD Blue made such a splash because, oh my goodness, it's handheld camera everywhere. It's like, you know, shaking and it's like, it's like it's a documentary. Oh, that's so exciting. It's like I'm really there. And, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and you wouldn't pan, for example, anticipating something from happening because if you were a documentarian, you wouldn't know that it was going to happen. So you wait for some character to talk and then you go over to find them. And it creates a different subjective experience in the audience. And there are shows today, obviously, that became a staple for many kinds of shows. But as an example, if I were hired to do NYPD Blue, which I, I didn't have the good fortune to work on, you know, I can't come in and just say, okay, we're going to do this all in lock offs. We're going to have elegant dolly moves. And it, you can't do that because. A, you'd be fired, but B, B, even if you got through the episode, you would not be communicating the way you thought you would think you'd be communicating because the audience has a different expectation. So what you, what, what you, how you deviate from those set those expectations are ex, is experienced as a deviation. So they're not just watching that as if it's the first show they've ever seen. They're saying, "Wait, what? What's happening? It's eerie. It's still. It's still." You might put them in an alert state. Wait, wait, no, that's not what I was trying to do. So you have to honor uh, uh, everything, and also the tone. I I've, uh, feel, feel very privileged uh, to have directed many different genres, from "It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia" to "The Wire." You know, and it's each 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 show has its own sensibility. And one of the things I really value about what I get to do is I get to uh, immerse myself in different ways of seeing. But when I enter any show, I have to honor it and I have to fully absorb its visual language, its tone, its sensibility, how points are made. And, uh, and, and you know, that's, if, if you don't do that, you're, you're, you're not serving the story. Well, you've mentioned that you love Robert Bly. Yes. I and so I have just a wow. quote here where he says, the best presenters have conversations with their audiences. So even if you can't, let's say, have a conversation with the audience of Homeland or The Wire, it, you you kind of know uh, the pulse of what they want. Yeah. So you, I think I didn't get to your question. So your question was, how much do I have to take into account the audience, right? Okay. Um, yeah, so an audience comes in with a set of expectations, and I and and you know you don't tune into you know the Sopranos and want to watch you know uh, you know ballroom drama, <laughs> you know. So it's like if you it's like so you if you're if you're providing it, it, and and the writers are generally you know almost universally very aware of that. So they have so we know oh, we've gone too long without a joke or we've gone too long without a so and so. And so you have to plug into that because if you don't you're you know you're not serving the show. Um, and that and that tone that's where tone can really uh, be a critical factor. Like for example, I'm trying to think I, I was a producer director on the show Big Love which was about uh, a polygamous household in Utah, Mormon, the, the, the kind of the uh, uh, what's the word? The fundamentalist Mormon Mormon community, and uh, there were these wonderful actors in it. You know, uh, uh, Bill Paxson, may rest in peace, and you know Chloe Sevigny, and you know Gene Triplehorn, and it was just it just a you know wealth of people, and all these dramas happening as you can imagine with three marriages and three wives and one guy and all that stuff. But one thing I had to be very mindful of, which the producers were constantly, you know, re reinforcing is, you know, in Utah, they're not a, they're not a therapy friendly place. People don't talk about their emotions necessarily. They don't display their emotions a lot. So even though a scene might be rife with rich subtext, you know, if you're shooting it in West Los Angeles where everybody's been to therapy and is perfectly happy to reveal their feelings and I don't know what you feel and this is what I feel. That's not that world. That's not that world. So if you're not attuned to the way, you know, so in a, in a shall we say, even, even repressed world or, or certainly suppressed, you know, people are very guarded and, and a lift eye, lifted eyebrow might be a very startling, startling thing to do, you know. So you have to be sensitized to what not just what the audience is expecting, but what the world of you don't want to betray the world of your story. What mistakes did you make directing your first episode of television? Mm. Yeah, that was uh, early in my career. I write a chapter about it in my book. It's the second chapter. I call it The School of Hard Knocks. 
Uh, I had wanted to be, and I grew up, you know, as a, 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 I watched films in the 60s and 70s and kind of loved the independent cinema world and, uh, you know, really aspired. That's what I want to do. I want to make, I want to be an auteur. And uh, my first job was a feature film in 1984, uh, Stephen King's Silver Bullet. <clears throat> not, I'm not a horror aficionado, but that was that was kind of often the the uh, the, the way in horror films to get get directing credits. And uh, and after I did that, uh, you know, I was determined I don't want to do a feature. I don't want to do a horror film for next. I want my next film to reflect more my sensibility. Even though I'm I'm pleased that it now seems to have a kind of a cult following, and I enjoy people telling me, that, oh, that was a film I really liked, but I didn't want to do more horror films. And uh, so I was, I went into, you know, trying to find material I liked, went into what they call development hell on a couple of things. Uh, and I became, I, I got in my own way a lot. I became so, so uh, critical about anything, uh, anything that was offered that I, I didn't really, I wasn't very quick to attach to things. And because I wasn't terribly experienced, I wasn't offered the you know the great scripts. I was offered things that really required work, and uh, as I was developing material, which never wound up getting made, uh, I was offered some television shows, and I thought of television. Well, television. This was in the mid '80s, and uh, you know at that time the so-called golden age hadn't hit. Uh, the second one, of course, the original one was the live television age, but you know, and and so it really wasn't. I didn't take it very seriously as an artistic form, but I took, I said, okay, well, maybe I can take some of this work to just develop my chops as a director, you know. And uh, one of the first jobs I was offered was Miami Vice in its third season, and that was the cool show. And it's interesting, too, because Miami Vice, which was spearheaded by Michael Mann, uh, was was a bit snobby about who they hired as director. They only wanted to hire feature directors, which I qualified for because I had done a feature. But what I knew about directing then compared to what I know about directing through directing series television was like a thimble compared to an ocean. And uh, But still I was hired for the job. And I came into it uh, with all kinds of ideas that really got in my way. One of which was I thought I had to know everything in advance. I thought I had to be the authority coming in. I thought I had to be, you know, I couldn't confess to not knowing something. I was reluctant to ask too many questions because I thought that would somehow uh, erode my authority. And I, and I, I even, I kidded myself. I lied to myself about things. And I, so I didn't, first of all, do as much prep as I needed to do. I didn't really immerse myself in the story. I thought, no, because I had a kind of romantic vision then too of what directing was. Oh, you have to be open creatively in the moment. Well, I've since found that to be most open in the moment, for me, I have to be fully prepared. And then I can be free enough to be open and trust the answers that will come for me. But then I didn't think that. So I, I started working on Miami Vice. And that was like, uh, at that time, Don Johnson was known as the King of Miami. And uh, he, he was a director himself. And I was very new to film language. I didn't, you know, I didn't have security about mm, how do you, how do you, what my shot list, I wasn't ever sure like mm, screen direction and what shots do I need to cut the sequence well. And I'd kind of, you know, come up with an idea. But when I'd show up on the set, you know, Don Johnson would frequently say, uh, what, uh, no, how about we do this? And he'd talk to the camera and he'd start walking all over me essentially, which was humiliating. But what was, what was equally challenging was that his ideas were better, which I recognized. <laughs> so I constantly felt, mm, well, I'm, I'm okay. So I felt my, my, my confidence sapped and everything else. In addition, uh, I didn't know the way of the world in episodic television, and I didn't really understand the inner workings, the inner politics of it all. And I was shooting in Miami while the producers, the creative team was in Los Angeles, and I was communicating everything that I wanted to do to the, to the line producer in Miami, thinking that was equivalent to talking to the other producers. And when I shot a sequence, I won't go into the details of it, but I, I fixed something that was problematic for the budget. Uh, and the line producer said, yeah, great. And then when the producers saw dailies, they freaked out because I hadn't cleared it with them. And suddenly I became uh, a, a fair target because part of that show is everybody was trying to be cooler than everybody else. And uh, everybody was looking for a scapegoat if it wasn't like a super cool show. And so I became a lightning rod suddenly because I had, 
I had done something that hadn't been cleared, and then I made a neophyte's mistake. I, I didn't, hadn't read the script carefully enough, and I misread uh, the tra a transfer of a body from the trunk of one car to the trunk of another, and I, had, I, I missed it. I had it go the other way because it had made story sense in a different way than what the writer had imagined, but I wasn't even conscious that I was changing it. I just misread it. And I, to this day, I can't figure out why the script supervisor didn't tell me, hey, it's written this way. It's the other way, but anyway. Uh, and as soon as that happened, in addition to not having shot uh, uh, the sequence as it had been written, uh, you know, it was, it was just a horrifically uh, challenging experience. And uh, there were a few other things that happened, and, and I didn't know if I was ever going to work again in television at, at that point. Uh, I was still more concerned with features, but it was, it was very painful, and there were other things about it that were difficult. The episode turned out well, actually, and it, and it gave me confidence that, oh, I do know how to tell a story, and despite no support, and despite my own uh, self-judgments and self-recriminations, I thought, you know, it works. The performances all were delivered. The story was told well but it was hard to overcome that, those original impressions. And I didn't get another job for several months because you know that was my only reference and it wasn't a good one. And I, the next job I got was on another show at that period called Beauty and the Beast. And that also was a popular show. And uh, it's interesting, it was, uh, for those of you, it's a, it's a retelling of, the story was uh, Ron Perlman played a lion-like mythological character who lived below the New York subways, and that was the underworld. And Linda Hamilton played the beauty in the upper world, and she would come, it was a, I think she was a news reporter, and she would come down, and they had this intense romance, which was very romantic. And, uh, and the story I was given was an interesting one because it was about a young man who, who uh, had a very intolerant father, single father, and he was miserable. The father could not credit the young boy's uh, interest in his own imagination. And uh, the, the showrunner of Beauty and the Beast knew that I was interested. I don't know how it was he knew that I was at that time uh, doing workshops and reading a lot of Robert Bly's work with men and, uh, and, and his partner, a mythologist, uh, Michael Mead, who still is doing great work up in Seattle. But I was very interested in initiation, male, young males' initiations, and this story seemed to be right up its alley. And uh, the showrunner actually called me and said, you're interested in this, let's, let's work on this, because that's what this story is about. And I was very excited about it. And I started filming, oh, and I, and I learned from the experience with, with Vice that my problem was I hadn't been willing to admit what I didn't know. I hadn't immersed myself in the story enough so I could take full responsibility for every aspect of the storytelling. And, and would develop a shot, uh, shot list and a way of seeing that I could defend and not just be a deer in the headlights when somebody had another idea. So I spent my entire prep overcoming my reluctance to admit what I didn't know, asking if I could spend time on the sets after hours, on the weekends, you know, even if it made me look like someone who was, who was their first job. And I spent, and it was a real, it was a real epiphany for me because I, I, I took total responsibility for every moment being communicated. I lived on the sets, I absorbed them as if they were characters themselves. I acted out in my imagination all the scenes, I developed staging ideas because I wanted, I didn't want to come in again not knowing. And, I, and which starts with admitting what you don't know, admitting what questions need answering. That's what I hadn't done on the first job. And it became very exhilarating to me so that I emerged with a vision of how to tell the story, and then I could enlist the help of all the collaborators. All they want to hear is what you want to do and what, what vision you're trying to hold. And then they bring their creativity, and it was thrilling. And I started directing, and within the first three or four, two or three days, they really, the producers were over the moon. They, they called me and said, oh my God, these are the most beautiful dailies we've ever had. The performances are amazing. And on the, I think the fourth day, or they came to me and said, you know, you're, the showrunner came to me and said, you know, you're the director I most trust. Our next episode is the most important one. Can you do it? And I said, wow, I don't know. I mean, I'd love to, but it's a holiday. Let me check with my wife and we can work it out for our family. And I said, okay, good. And he says, great. So I had about three more days of filming. And about two days later, there was some shift that happened. It was very bizarre. Suddenly they weren't calling me and... And I, sh I shot a scene uh, for the ending of the show and the, the showrunner finally did call me and I could tell he was furious at me. 
And I said, what? He said, you didn't shoot a close-up of the father. And I said, well, we can shoot it tomorrow if you want it. But the reason I didn't is the story we had discussed doing in advance was that this was a story of an initiation. And that the story, not to get in too involved about it, but the boy travels to the underworld, finds an inner father who will bless him, who is embodied by Ron Perlman's beast, and it, it allows him to survive the intolerant other father, and that, and that a key initiatory challenge is to develop containment. So that the scene the showrunner was asking me about was when he reemerges from the underworld and the father is there to greet him with, uh, with a battalion of firemen and police, and Linda Hamilton's character is also there, and the father embraces him, who's never touched him the whole episode, he's just been angry at him. The key moment is the look between Linda Hamilton and the boy in the, while he's in the embrace of the father. Is he going to stay with containing what he knows? Because if he reveals the existence of the underworld, it will be the, its undoing. And so he looks at Linda Hamilton, she looks at him, and they understand in that moment that he's going to contain this. And so he's been blessed, he's, going to, he's on his way to manhood. And that was the story. To cut to a close-up of the father, I thought would muddy the issue. His feelings were not the appropriate thing. So I said, that's what I thought the story was. But if you want us to get this other moment, we'll get it tomorrow, which we did. And when I finished the episode, expecting to start the next day on the, on the, the, the following episode, I was told, oh, there's been some rethinking about this. And you're, you're going to report to the showrunner's office tomorrow. And I felt like I was being summoned to the principal's office. <laughs> but what happened was I, I showed up and, you know, it reminded me of a scene, I don't know if any of your viewers saw the movie Network, but there was a famous scene when Peter Finch's anchorman character comes in to meet with uh, Ned Beatty's producer character in a conference room. And Ned Beatty just glowers over him and says, do you know what you're fucking with? That was, that was the feeling I had. That was, oh my God, this guy starts telling me and he's, he's, I remember his opening words. He says, I was seduced by your beautiful style and I miss that you have absolutely no capacity to elicit emotion. And I said, what? What's going on? I said, because that was the one thing I'd never been accused of. I'm good, very good with actors and getting in. And it's also, I was flattered because I didn't have a visual plan in the previous episode. And now he said I had a beautiful visual style. So that was great. And I, I said, what are you talking about? And something had shifted in him and he had developed, made a case against me. And what I came to understand is he had gotten cold feet about his, the whole thrust of the episode we had agreed upon going in because, you know, it's interesting, showrunners get to inhabit a very exalted position. You know, you really feel like you're on top of the world. You can even be a star yourself as a showrunner. And if your show gets canceled, it can be like going from the penthouse to the basement, boom, like that. And you could just join the throng of throngs of unemployed writers, you know, and I think he started to feel like, wait, we're not giving our audience the sentimentality, the romantic sentimentality we usually, they tune in for. And, and I said, well, and, I, and, I, and I realized that, you know, I understood, this goes to an earlier question you asked me, it's like what, what the audience's expectations were. I, I understood that that was an element of the show and I, I thought that actually we were uh, enhancing the uh, romance between Lynn Hamilton and Ron Perlman's characters by virtue of the fact that they were playing surrogate roles, surrogate parental roles with this young boy and they were bonding together as they were doing that. But the story I was handed was not a sentimental story. It was, a, I thought, a much more tough-minded one and a much more meaningful one. And I think he got cold feet. I think he got worried that I wasn't, so hence the need for a sentimental shot of the father at exactly the wrong time. But he had made a case against me and his producers who were just very slavish to him, you know, were, were supporting him and all that. And he said, you even undermined the key visual st uh, moments in the show, the, the, our visual uh, uh, highlights. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said that there was a visual uh, uh, trick they use on every episode when, um, when you'd go into the underworld, you'd walk into the subway tunnels and you'd enter what looked like a skylight, but it was a super bright light. And as soon as the character goes in, they just would disappear. And he said, you didn't shoot that. And I looked at the producer who was on set with me when I didn't shoot it, and he didn't say a word. I said, well, the reason we didn't shoot it is a light malfunctioned on the day, and I knew we'd have to come back at expense, great expense another time, which we could certainly do. But I said, while we're here, maybe there's a way around it. 
Maybe the boy could approach, the light could be photographed. It's just when someone went into it, they wouldn't disappear. So maybe the boy could be moving towards it and then we could cut to Linda Hamilton watching him disappear as the audience would assume he had and turn away. I said, if it doesn't work, fine, we have to come back. We'd have to come back anyway, but if it does work, we have it. But he was convinced I was actively trying to sabotage him. So it was a crazy, crazy experience. And now I'd had two terrible experiences <laughs> in terms of future references. And I thought, well, am I ever gonna work again? And I did finally, of course, get another job several months later. And ironically, it was with a showrunner who had worked on Beauty and the Beast and didn't care at all about what had been said because he had been on staff there and had seen these exact kinds of accusations leveled routinely at other people, himself included. You're undermining the show or whatever. So he says, I don't, I don't care about any of that. And on this show, uh, it, was, it, was, it was interesting. I started working on it. I, I applied the same lessons I'd learned from the need to really prep and get fully immersed. I started shooting and on the second or third day, I got a phone message and I'm listening and it says, oh, it was producer director. We love your dailies. The performances are great. We just couldn't be happier. And I remember I was in San Francisco. I was walking to the set and I just remember just dropping the phone Think, boy, am I glad I had that experience on Beauty and the Beast so, so I know not to take any of that seriously. And I stopped myself thinking, wow, is that really what I feel? I'm glad for having gone through that horrible experience. And I realized I was because it had acquainted me with uh, so much about the nature of these shows and what the political interactions are and sensitizing me to that. I mean, if, if they hadn't liked the show, I would have, uh, what I was doing, I would certainly want to hear about it and I would try to, you know, accommodate them, but I knew that I wasn't going to be so dependent anymore on, you know, someone else's opinion. I'm not, and I'm not going to necessarily, you know, assume I'm at fault or go into a dark hole if, if, if a choice I've made isn't agreed with. So that was, that was big, but what was most important, what I realized was that the real gift of Beauty and the Beast was the experience I had before it ever blew apart, when I knew to just go on the set, spend, which I do to this day, just immerse myself in the story, to find out what I care about, find out what might need to be changed for me to care about it more, find out in advance what walls might need to be made wild, meaning you could take it out when you're shooting away from it, but put it back in when you're shooting towards it, giving you a better frame. All of those things I learned to just to, and to, to, just to be fully, uh, take full responsibility for the storytelling. That was the real gift of Beauty and the Beast, and I've, I've made use of those gifts, I think, for the rest of my career. And so do you think that it's more detrimental to the set to have a director who yells mm -hmm. and is somewhat of a bully or a director that uh, doesn't own their authority? And it's, and as yeah, you said earlier, neither, do you yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, set demeanor is, 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 a, is, a, is a real issue. Uh, and one of the uh, requirements, or one of the realities of being a director is that you're the one in command. And you can either accept the responsibilities that come with that, accept, take ownership of that role, or not. Now, there's all kinds of ways to take ownership of that. There's all kinds of ways to to have command and to demonstrate command. It does not mean you have to be commanding. I think, you know, as I've thought about it, and I wrote a chapter called Inner States in my book that addresses this among a few other things. Uh, I think those who have command are those who, the, the crew and the cast, they have to feel that within you there is a there there, that you're taking responsibility for the storytelling and that, uh, and that the buck stops with you. Now. I think the best leaders are those who are willing to acknowledge what they don't yet know and are, are, and are interested in collaborating and are interested in getting the best from the people around them because you know, there are so many people that have expertise that I as the director don't have. You know, the director of photography knows far more about, about light sensitivity and lensing and all that than I do. I have ideas and I'll make suggestions. But I, I, I cut off my nose to spite my face if I insist, you know, if, I don't, if I'm not interested at least in hearing you know, another point of view. Same with same with production designers and and prop people and 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 uh, you know wardrobe and hair. All these people. What I try to do is is carry a vision for what story. Communicate a vision for what story I'm telling. Where I think the emotional reality lies. Where what subjective state I'm hoping to create for individual scenes. 
communicate that without telling necessarily how to achieve that. And so someone, and then, then you're enlisting the creativity of everybody to come up with ways that I might never have thought about. You know, uh, so, so how to get the best from your collaborators is I think the mark of a, uh, getting the best from your collaborators I think is the mark of a good leader. You know, we all have insecurities. We all have our personalities we bring into it. One of the, one of the things that, uh, you know, is a constant learning for me, and I, you know, I, earlier in my career it was not something I could always hold in mind, is how much people project onto you as the director. You know, you're the authority figure. Now, you know, uh, you, you probably experience yourself as the flawed human being that we all are, but when you're in a position of authority, other people are looking to you. And, and as the director, you know, you have the great, great power to influence their own sense of job security or even self-worth. You know, if they project, who knows what they're projecting on you. So it's important to accept that role and to be, and to be I would say, benign. That's not to say, I mean, that, that's also means sometimes you have to set boundaries. You have to you hold people accountable. It doesn't mean you're always saying yes to everything or it's a love fest. You know, sometimes people don't measure up and don't, don't take responsibility for their own areas they need to take responsibility for. And I think as a leader, you need to make that clear that you expect better. But, you know, when you are um, uh, abrupt and, uh, uh, you know, dictatorial, I, I, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make me want to cooperate with that person. And I assume that's how others are going to react. And I think it also betrays an insecurity that people at a deeper level understand. So which also makes people uneasy, regardless of how they're being treated personally, they don't feel they're in good hands. They don't feel actors, for example, may not feel the story is going to get told well, because this person is insecure and is just not listening to me, won't even hear it. They're too rigid. So, uh, there's that problem, and then there's also the problem when you know when you, you when a director doesn't take responsibility, you can always feel that when you walk on the set because there's a kind of vacuum there. You know, no one really knows who's going to make the decision, and that leads to an enervation and a kind of you know, you don't get your, the best from your uh, collaborators. I think there's a baseball metaphor I like, which is, you know, the the pitchers with the best control are the ones for whom the defense plays better because they know, like for example, if a batter comes up, you know, I don't know if many, any, many of you are baseball fans, but like on a diamond, if you pitch someone, if a right-handed hitter is up and you pitch on the outside, the likelihood is they're gonna hit the ball more to the right side. They're not gonna be able to get around. So if the infielders see that the catcher is signaling for the ball to come to the outside and they know they can count on their pitcher to hit that spot, they'll gravitate more to that side and be in better position to field it. If the pitcher's wild and throw it anywhere, they don't know what to do, you know. Uh, so, you know, taking responsibility makes everybody feel, feel, you know, I think more willing to contribute themselves so long as the one taking responsibility is respectful and interested in what they, the others can bring. You mentioned the director's role and being benign. I think you used some example of a, a Francois Truffaut yeah. film where there was a hearing aid yeah, yeah, as yeah. it related yeah, to yeah. Well, a director's role. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things that's that's not often spoken about is, uh, and I haven't read a lot of the literature that's been written about directing, but the, the, that I, the, the, the ones that the books that I have seen and, and also just the discussion generally about directing and and when I talk to young directors and the people, no one seems particularly interested or aware necessarily of the wide range of emotional challenges that you face as the director, the stresses, the bombardment with questions, the need to come up with answers, you know, all the insecurities and, and different moods, the impatience you can get when something isn't happening fast enough or when, it, when an actor isn't understanding something or, you know, it's like it can, it can, creates such a wide variety of emotional states that one of the really important qualities to develop is, is I, I think of it as mindfulness, is, willing, is containment, is being willing to acknowledge what's happening within you and still keep your, you know, see the forest for the trees and keep your eyes on the prize and maybe a few more cliches I could throw in. But, you know, to, uh, to so, so that there are these, these stressors as a director. You know, uh, is this good? Am I getting this? Oh my God, it's not time. We are only on this three more scenes. The most important scene is at the end of the day and I'm gonna have to rush it because I had all these things you have to, constant prioritizing and 
always trying to think, and my way through, by the way, is to always emphasize story, that that's the thing I have to focus on. What's the story point? What's, you know, how, if I have to simplify something, I don't want to simplify, I don't want to lose a story point. I might sac have to sacrifice a beautiful shot that was time consuming, but getting a beautiful shot and missing the story is not even a consideration. You know, you, you've got to, I, for me anyway, you've got to keep telling the story. And uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the states that I, I mentioned in my book that you cite is that, you know, Francois Truffaut, brilliant filmmaker, one, uh, maybe my very favorite film director, maybe my very favorite film is The 400 Blows, a Buddha Sufla, which he made in 1959, which I didn't see when it came out, but I saw it a little after, and it's a beautiful film, autobiographical film. He made an, another wonderful film, several, but one in particular called La Nuit Américaine, which was translated as Day for Night. And that's, you know, the term that, a film term, when you, you know, shoot uh, um, a night sequence in the middle of the day by stopping down the camera. A lot of Westerns used to do that. So when you see a Western and it's like, it's night, but you're seeing everything across the plane and everybody, you know, well, you didn't, they didn't light that whole thing. What they did is they, they limited the exposure to the film so that it would just look darker. Uh, so anyway, that was that's a film term. But in Day for Night, he played he played a director of a film coming together. It's a wonderful film, and one of the things I love about it too is it it really does capture the feeling of what it can be like, even on series television. When you when you worked for a period of time and you've worked with various different crews, and then you move around and crews spread out and the makeup person from this show is winds up, oh, on this new show, oh, I know you. And, and the, you know, the key grip is some, oh yeah, I remember we worked on. So this show is great. It showed everybody kind of coming together and this whole world getting created to create this film. And Truffaut played the director and he was dealing, in this little sly twist, I thought, you know, everybody's coming to him, they're producing, we don't have enough money. And he's saying, okay, we'll deal with that. And the actor's saying, and I just got out of the psychiatric ward and I have to, you know, and his, you know, we have to deal with that. And okay, I'm dealing with that. And then the star, and it's like all, and everybody's coming in with questions. And he gave his character a hearing aid so that he could just simply at some times just say, I can't hear you. <laughs> and it's like, and I thought that was really a great little twist because it's like, I, I thought it just spoke to a fantasy you know, many directors have is it would be nice sometimes to just tune it all out. Just give me a break. Let me just <laughs> let me just chill for a minute. But you know, the reality is, the director is the one person who can't be missing in action. Can you tell us some of the challenges you face directing the second episode of The Sopranos? Yeah, The Sopranos as it was interesting. I had uh, met David Chase when he was a showrunner on Northern Exposure, which was uh, a wonderful show in the. Uh, in the mid '90s, which I, I really recommend people seek out, uh, and I, I, David then went on to direct the pilot for The Sopranos, and uh, there were several months before HBO decided to make it as a series, <clears throat> and I was very uh, uh, honored and happy that David called me to direct the first episode that would air following the pilot, uh, and, they, and they came. They, so the company came together. I think six or nine months after the pilot had been. The original pilot had been shot. So uh, when I saw the pilot, I just said, oh my God, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. And, uh, uh, and there, were, there, were, there were the challenges. It was almost like shooting a pilot again because it was a whole new company coming together and it was the first episode. And James Gandolfini, for example, who had made a wonderful career as a kind of a part-time player in a, a lot of different shows, was not used to a television schedule. I remember the first scene we shot, he was ready to call it a day. And he said, no, no, James, we got four more scenes today. Uh, but one of the interesting uh, things in that episode, it was called 46 Long, and it's, I, I directed other episodes of The Sopranos. That may be my favorite one. So uh, uh, if you haven't seen it, I really recommend it. But uh, among uh, some of the mo more memorable moments in it was, the, 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 the episode actually was about Tony having to commit his mother, uh, played by Nan Livia, played by Nancy Marchand, to a uh, assisted living facility. And one thing I'll share that David Chase has spoken about is that, uh, and what really informed the series and gave it a lot of real great inner life, is that David had a mother that was the model for Livia, a real kind of sociopathic, misanthropic human being that uh, was very challenging for him, just as you see Nancy Marchand's behavior is so challenging for Tony Soprano. Uh, 
Uh, and in this episode, uh, he's trying to convince her to go into uh, Green Grove Retirement Community. And uh, one of the things that finally uh, convinces him that he has to force her to is that there's a, there's a very funny scene in the, in the episode where she's dropping her friend off uh, at home and she drives this big green honker of a car up a steep driveway and the friend just gets out and get, leans down to pick up the newspaper and Nancy Marshall looks behind her, thinks she's backing out, but then presses the accelerator and runs into the, into the friend who falls right back into the windshield. And it, it, was, it was one of those moments, fortunately the stunt person was all right, but uh, it was one of those moments that it just, sometimes it happens, that fate is with you and the elements just come together. It was a beautiful, fun stunt. But one of the challenges I had, and I cite this in the book because I, I, I have a chapter entitled Creating the World of Your Story, which is another way of saying creating, contextualizing things. Um, because context, uh, contextualizing is so important to bring the audience along to acquaint them with what are the conditions that if they're being acquainted with, it permits them to understand what's happening. If you don't do that work, your things can happen and they don't land because people don't understand in what context they're happening or what's what's going on. So that part of much of the job of directing for me is to is to kind of fill in things for an audience of you know as as unobtrusively as as you know without calling attention to it. I'm acquainting them with the, the rules of this world and and the, situ the the specifics of the situation. And in the pilot, many people I'm sure will recall, you know, Tony was revealed as suffering from panic attacks and he had, he had uh, sought out uh, Lorraine uh, Bracco playing Dr. Melfi as help and that was one of the genius conceits of the whole show, the mob boss having uh, talk therapy. So in this episode, there was one sequence where uh, I wanna talk about it just because it was uh, an example of finding a way to contextualize something to give the audience a deeper experience of it. And uh, there was a, an early sequence when Tony is approached at his place of work. Um, he goes into work and uh, he's having to juggle many things. He's having to juggle uh, trying to reach a important business partner and his, assist, his guy who's answering the phone being totally inept and cutting him off and him worried about that. He's having to adjust with various people coming up to him, Silvio and Christopher and other, with their own, their own needs and saying to Tom, we gotta do this. And they're all, they're trying to please him, but they all feel entitled to his attention. So that was one of the things I wanted to do. I wanted to create the sense of the stress Tony lived with. So I would direct all, so one of the things I did was to direct all the actors to make sure when they approached Tony that they felt completely entitled to take all of his time to hear the, the particulars, their intention being to impress their boss, but they're not aware that comedically they're actually pissing him off a lot because they're not allowing him to get to the 12 other things he has to do. So that was kind of happening. And he also was having to find the, uh, his wife, Carmela, has asked him to help, help out Junior's uh, junior high school teacher who had his Saturn car stolen. Can't we try to find it? So he's having to please Carmela. He's having to please this business associate. He's having to, to address all of his, you know, all of his uh, underlings needs. And he's, you can see he's just tightly wound, but he's doing a really great job of it. And uh, until he gets a call from his mother. And that's the show-stopping centerpiece of the sequence. When you get to see the dynamic and the, between Livia and Tony. All right, so I wanted to create a context for understanding that the first gambit was, of course, to give everybody this kind of entitlement as they approach him and, and not responding to any of his cues that he has anything else to think about. But with Olivia, I wanted to kind of somehow uh, create in the audience a, an awareness of how difficult a personality she was for him. And I thought, you know, this is a strip club. This is the Bada Bing, as everybody knows, most people. And, uh, and there were these nude dancers on the dance floor, you know, doing the pole dancing. And I thought it would be really interesting if I, when Tony takes the call from his mother, if I position him in such a way that these nude dancers are dancing behind his head. And that also affected my lens choices because, uh, you know, it, to shoot, say, a, a shot this size on a person, a close up, you can do it with a long lens, which means you see very little of the background behind because it's telephoto. 
or you can bring the camera in really close and have a wide lens, which means you see, you know, the whole room. So I chose a wide lens to shoot Tony, you know, answering this call from his mother who, you know, misses no opportunity to guilt trip him about his inattention. And while he's talking to her and she's being very, very difficult, these nude women are dancing behind his head. And I don't know that anybody would have made this connection, but I think subliminally you make the connection that when he's talking to this woman who invokes these kind of primal feminine forces that are so difficult for him, I thought having these nude dancers behind his head as he's talking to his mother would somehow humanize Tony and like, like it, was, it would, it would, you know, make him the child again in, to, against, you know, with, with these, these feminine figures, powerful feminine figures kind of dancing in his head that he's powerless to defend against. So uh, that was how I filmed it. And I thought that, uh, you know, and then the scene was great. I mean, Livia winds up setting fire to her kitchen and Tony doesn't know what to do. He says, stop everything he's doing and run, you know, get Carmela to go over to the house. So it kicked off the episode in an interesting way, but I thought it was by contextualizing the moment in a subtle way that wasn't scripted. It was a way, you know, it's a, it's a touch that a director has opportunity to bring if you can think of it that way. You know, there was another instance of that I'll cite in another great show I was fortunate to direct, The Wire. Uh, I directed several of, several seasons of The Wire. I, 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 I directed an episode in four of the five seasons. And in the last season, I directed an episode called Transitions. And, one of, and that showed various characters transitioning to different uh, levels of responsibility or within the hierarchy, either of the drug culture or the police department. And you know, several climactic thing hap things happened, one of which was <clears throat> Prop Joe, one of the beloved characters, beloved, he was a tough drug dealer, but he was a great character. He's executed in this episode by the character Marlo. So you see him transitioning to the end of his life while Marlo transitions to ascend to the top of the drug hierarchy. There were various transitions like that happening throughout. And one of them was between two characters who were a kind of comedic relief a lot of the time, but also genuine characters in their own right, two police uh, Carver and Herc. And uh, Herc, the previous season, they'd gotten and they'd had a lot of misadventures together we'd seen over various seasons. And finally, Herc had been drummed out of the force for some indiscretion he had done. <clears throat> Carver in this season has been promoted to become a sergeant. So he's having to see things from the other side of the desk in a little different way. And uh, what happens in the episode is that um, he, he sees that he has more responsibility and that he can no longer look the other way. And one of his, uh, one of the p police guys working beneath him has done something very bad. He's actually attacked a school teacher in the midst of a routine drug bust. And he's been cited by the department and the police, his own troops are gathering around him. Okay, this is how we're gonna do it. You know, we'll tell him, you know, uh, the guy was being obstructionist, which we know he wasn't. He was a simple bystander. And Carver confronts the character as Calicchio, as a character for those of fans of The Wire. And he tells Calicchio, he's trying to help him. And he says, uh, okay, um, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna say this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. And Calicchio says, nah, fuck him. He was an asshole and I'm glad I did what I did. And Carver just looks at him and just says, okay, you're toast, I'm turning you in. And Calicchio says, then you're a rat. And, Cal and Carver just says, then I'm a rat. And I'll say this, this wasn't the point I was gonna to get to, I'm gonna to get to another point. But that was fun, that was a fun moment for me because I, I realized, I, I helped the actor with Carver with that line because he had originally played it really oppositionally. Then I'm a rat, you know, angry at him. And I said, you know, since we're dramatizing a transition, I think it'd be much better if you realize you can't communicate to this guy, with this guy. You're not, you, you see in his refusal to take responsibility that you, he's lost you. So let him think whatever he wants. Don't oppose him like to change his view. And he just threw it away and says, then I'm a rat. Knowing I'm not a rat, you're an asshole. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so that was kind of a nice moment. But the point I was trying to get to was that there is a scene where the other police officers try to get Carver to reconsider, not to turn in Calicchio. So they enlist the help of his former, former partner, Herc, who's no longer in the force. 
and they get Herc to meet with him in the parking lot of the precinct to say, try to talk some sense in him. Come on, appeal. Come on, we're brothers here. Don't, don't do this. So there's a scene where the two of them are having a beer in the uh, precinct parking lot. And again, trying to contextualize, I put, I put uh, a symbol of Herc's new, he's, he's now signed on with a corrupt lawyer and he's gone for the money. And he's driving a Mercedes. So I put a Mercedes right there. And so Carver is sitting on the hood of a police car with, with Herc on the police car, but you can see the, the Mercedes. So you get a sense of, okay, this is how things have changed. And in the course of the discussion, what's going to happen is Herc is going to say, come on, come on, what do you think? Maybe cut him some slack. You know, is it really so bad? And Carver doesn't answer him directly. Instead, he spins a story, which we've seen in, in a previous season. Herc had, had missed his, had, had not acted on something he, he needed to act on in order to save one of the most endearing characters, a young boy named Randy, who had snitched and uh, helped the police in a way he should have because it was a horrific thing that he, he witnessed. But he made it very clear, you can't tell anyone that this has happened or I'm, I'm dead. And uh, he, they set up a set of, set of signals that would happen if it looks like he's about to be outed. And the police were gonna correct, you know, somehow create a different impression. And Herc missed the signal. So the boy, Randy, wound up getting labeled as a snitch and he wasn't killed, but he was sent to a reform school where he was beaten every day and he was totally deadened as a character. And Carver knows this. And instead of answering Herc directly, he says, you know, Randy, you know that character, Randy? And Herc says, yeah, so what? He says, well, you know, we let him down. You let him down. He says, yeah, so what? He says, well, it matters is what. It all matters. So you get that sense that in this moment, you're watching a transition happen, that, Herc, that, that Carver has now accepted that there are consequences to the way we act. And the force of how he did it simply shows Herc that he's right. And Herc, instead of transforming Carver is himself transformed. And he says, you do what you have to do. Turn Coikio in. It's the right thing to do. Don't, 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 don't care at all what the other guys think about it. It's the right thing to do. Okay, so that's the transition. That's what we're dramatizing. And it's a powerful scene and it, would, and it played great and they did great. But I was thinking, what can I do to contextualize this, to give it perhaps greater depth and resonance? And I, and during prep, I remembered a previous episode of The Wire. And one of the great things about The Wire and the storytelling in The Wire, David Simon and Ed Burns, David Simon created the show. They never spoke down to the audience and they never, never felt they had to recapitulate things. You know, in so many stories, if there's a story point that references something from two seasons ago, either they'll show it previously on and they'll show that, or they'll have characters talk about, reset it so that people have it in their minds when they watch it here. The Wire never did that. If you missed something in a season, you missed it. And then, you know. But I had seen something in a previous season where David Simon had scripted that when the police exit into the precinct parking lot and drinking beer, they ritually would hurl their beer cans or bottles up onto the roof. And the reason he put that in is he had, he had embedded with the Baltimore Homicide Department and he loved, and this was a real thing they did, so he loved injecting these authentic touches into the wire. And I remembered this scene where these guys, apropos of nothing in particular, but they just had a beer, drank, and said, hey, hey, and they threw it up on the roof. And I thought, okay, how, might it be an interesting thing to start the scene from the rooftop and have a camera gliding across all these discarded cans and bottles and seeing in the frame down below Carver and Herc seated on the car, small figures. And it would perhaps contextualize what was happening here by contextualize this as a kind of ritual space. This is a place where policemen gather and let their hair down and act and just, you know, speak truth to one another. And so that's what I did. And I had, I had in prep, I asked the prop department to go co make sure you collect tons of cans and bottles and all that. And they did it, you know, they were, you know, and we had a special, you know, we had to get the camera up on the roof and make sure it was safe and at a low camera angle. And I just, just, I didn't, I didn't say anything about it, but I just started the shot going over these, these discarded cans and bottles. So the hope was that the transition that audiences would watch happening would have a deeper significance 
because it would be as if it's a transition within the culture itself because we were in this ritualized space. Didn't, didn't cut back to it, didn't do anything else, but it just set a context for those who really were careful viewers of the show. I think they'd experience the scene a little more deeply. How do you get the best out of your actors? Mm. You know, uh, directing actors is, I think, the, I would identify as the most important responsibility of the director. Uh, of course, there's many, many other things one is responsible to, as the, uh, responsible for as the director. But to me, the, well, let me read what I wrote. Yeah, uh, your book is right is, there. Okay. Yeah, this is my book. Great. Directing Great Beautiful. Television. And I have a chapter on um, directing actors, which is a, the second longest chapter in the book. The other is on the language of camera. But um, let me just read the opening of it and then I'll maybe take off from that sure. and uh, summarize some of the things I do discuss. But I write, I start the chapter. Watching a great performance take shape is one of the true thrills of directing. Something emerges that is deep and revealing about being human. Helping your cast get there is among the director's most important responsibilities. Some projects are more actor dependent than others. But in my experience, a story's impact is directly related to how much truthfulness, emotional honesty, and depth of understanding the actors bring to their performance. That's not to say that every character is truthful, honest, or deep, quite the contrary. But actors who have accessed those qualities in themselves are in a better position to enrich the story. And I think that's so true because I know as, as I'm watching something, it's like if I know, if I feel the actor is in touch with something true and interesting, if I'm drawn to that actor because there's something compelling about who they are, because they're fully online, let's say, fully in touch with something deep that they're working with, the story, I mean, that's, that's what I think typifies almost any great performance. It doesn't mean they're intense. It doesn't mean they're anything else. They could be putting up a front. They could be, you know, disaffected characters. But, there, but there's an inner life that leads to that kind of expression. And the actors need, you know, the best performances are those who've filled in that inner life. So that it's coming, it's like a deep well of, of experience that just manifests in this, this one way. As opposed to just saying, well, I'm disaffected, so I'm just going to be disaffected. I'm not going to feel anything. You know, you, you might be feeling a lot of work not to feel something as opposed to just not feeling something. So uh, getting the performance is, is, is a great responsibility and a great experience, I find. And every actor is different. Uh, you know, every, you know, many directors are frightened of actors. They, they feel like they're a different species. Well, they're not. They're, they're human beings. You know, there's, there's a whole range of cliches about actors, that they might be narcissistic or self-important or overly dramatic or whatever. And, and, you know, some of them are, just like directors, you know, just like anybody. But really, what your job is as a director is to help the, direct, help the actor uh, uh, be able to utilize their particular process, how they work. And so that it involves kind of reading each human being that you're approaching to direct for who they are and how you can connect to them. It's a very intimate, intimate experience. And I found, you know, it's a big, big topic. And I can't, you know, I, I, I but I, I, you know, I think there are some of the things I can just briefly touch on is, I think first of all, uh, you need to develop trust with an actor, because you're asking them to, you're, you want to share, you want them to invite you into their process, you know, so, so if they don't trust you, they're not likely to do that. So in, in, to be trustworthy, I find you also have to be as authentic as possible. So I try to be, because I want an authentic performance from them also. So I have to, you know, if, if nothing else, I have to model that. I'm willing to be authentic. I want you to be willing to be authentic. And it also helps to, <clears throat> helps to elicit trust. Um, different actors need different things, you know, different, you know, actors, you know, some, sometimes they need to be acquainted with the imaginary circumstances. Sometimes they haven't defined what's at issue in a way that is consonant with your understanding of the story, or they haven't enriched their character's inner life as much as you'd like them to do. So sometimes you're involved in, in helping them with that. The one thing you don't want to do is, uh, is to tell them 
exactly how to do something. I mean, there's a, there's a kind of a, it's become kind of a bromide about don't give result directions, meaning like, do it angry. Well, you know, you might want that to be the ultimate outcome of their performance, but you know, you're cutting them off from their impulses. You have to give them a reason for why. You have to justify that because you want it to feel like real human behavior. Uh, the other thing about telling an actor how to do something is you're, you're communicating to them that you don't trust their own instincts, you know, and that's, that's the worst thing. You know, it's like what I'm always trying to do is, is to uh, invite the actor to explore themselves and make it truthful for them. I'll, try, I'll do whatever I can to acquaint them with what, what I'd like them to explore. But, you know, if, if they're not connected to an, inter, an inner, to their own inner resources, then you know you might get them to do a particular moment the way you tell them to do it, but what about the next moment? You know, and 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 also they're probably not connected to their scene partners because they're thinking about doing something a particular way. And you know, it's when when actors aren't connected to their scene partners, you generally feel it. It's hard to fake connection. You know, you want that kind of moment to moment connectivity, uh, and you want to provide. Then another thing you you want to work on with actors, it's always very helpful. I find. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a cliche about uh, that people have a lot of fun with, with the actor saying, what's my motivation? Well, yeah, you can have a lot of fun with that, but the reality is that's kind of the key question an actor needs to ask and also a director needs to ask. And actors need to be aware, of, I like to think of, think of it this way, that it's important to know a character's motivations on a lot of levels of the character's own awareness. For example, uh, the example I cite in the book too, it's like, you know, if a, if a character wants to uh, impress his boss or her boss, it may be, that's one level of a motive, but it may be it's really his father he wants to impress in a deeper level. So that, you know, there's gradations, of, there's depths of intentionality. Um, what are some of the other things? Uh, Another thing is you have to be willing to uh, take responsibility in a way you have to be you have to be willing to deliver a note that might not be easy to do if you're going to ask an actor to change the way they're thinking about it. I mean it helps of course as I say to gain trust, to gain their goodwill. But often, you know, you you can be in a situation where an actor has made a choice that's just not appropriate for what you think the story is. And one of, the, one of the ways I approach that often is uh, I try to share with the actor where a particular moment in the story is falling. There was an example I, I uh, cite in the book from uh, an episode of Homeland I directed called uh, 13 Hours in Islamabad, which was a very intense episode. And I was working with Mandy Patinkin, who is one of the most intuitive, sensitively attuned actors with whom I've ever worked. He's very method. And he's very goes in deep place within himself, and and uh, Mandy will actually say this early in his career he was often pretty intractable and was not very open to directors giving them advice about it. He said, "I know how I want to play this." He's he's mellowed a lot in that regard, and as has just been brilliant in Homeland. Well, in this particular episode, um, let's see what's happened leading up to the scene is there's uh, the the uh, the ISIS has kind of taken over this as it overrun the pack the American embassy in Pakistan killed 37 Americans it's a complete disaster and the reason they were able to do it was because Saul Mandy's character uh, had been captured by ISIS and uh, he had been used as a bargaining chip to draw out the forces from uh, the embassy to to affect the prisoner exchange so ISIS knew, and it's, I don't think it was called ISIS in the show, but I'll stand in for terrorist organization, uh, knew that the embassy was not sufficiently guarded. And then they had to gotten other information. So it, and Saul blames himself for having gotten captured because he was inattentive. He did something he shouldn't have done. He got, a, he got lured into a trap that he punishes himself for not having figured out. So it's the night of it's the night of this thing. It's just happened. It's a complete disaster. Everybody is in their own personal crisis, and uh, Saul is being debriefed by Rupert Friend's character. Um, I'm blanking on his character's name, but uh, 
So Rupert is, is interrogating Saul and Carrie, Claire Dane's character, is watching the interrogation. And it was a very intense uh, six or seven page sequence. Uh, I asked for an hour, I asked for a rehearsal in advance of the call time because I knew there was going to be a lot to really work out moment to moment. So I asked for an hour long. I mean, people who do features might think an hour, that's nothing. But <laughs> if I could get an hour, that was, that was, it would have to be enough. So I asked the actors to come in an hour before crew call and we'd try to work out, you know, all the nuances. And uh, so the shape of the scene was that uh, Rupert, who has witnessed his compatriots executed and is, is just in a mania of trying to capture Haqqani, who is the lead terrorist, he's got to have something to go on. And he's, he's interrogating Saul. What, what did you see when you were in captivity? You know, give me something, give me something. I've got to find this guy. And Saul is bereft. And he's, he says, I, I didn't see anything. I was hooded the whole time. He says, okay, well, and, and, and the windows are blacked out. And, and Rupert says, well, uh, what about the phones, the cell phones that they gave you? He says, they were changed out every day. I don't know what cell phones. And Rupert gets furious at Saul and yells at him, you have to do better. You have to stop. Give me something, give me something. And Mandy's reaction in the first rehearsal was rage. He just stood up to Rupert and just yelled, how can I see, how could I know what I didn't see? And he yells at him and, and Manny Patinkin is capable of unbelievable power and fury. Now what's supposed to happen at this point is Claire Danes is supposed to enter. She's outside of this, uh, this safe room, it's glass walls, but she can't hear what's going on, but she sees what's happening and she comes into the room and she says to Rupert Friend, we've got to talk and they go outside. So we, we rehearsed the scene and I knew that Mandy had made this choice. He preps very hard and he had thought a lot about it. And uh, I knew, well, it's powerful, it's legitimate. He's punishing himself for, you know, he's very upset with himself. It's legitimate in terms of his character choice, but it's not right for this moment in the scene. Because for this moment in the scene, the story point we're trying to give the audience is that Rupert has become so monomaniacally attached to vengeance that he's becoming a bit inhuman himself. And he's gonna take some terrible risks, both for himself and for others, in this episode and in future episodes. So we wanted to cue the audience to this happening, to seeing what's happening within him. And Carrie intervenes because she has seen Rupert, Rupert's excessiveness, how he's hitting a man when he's already down. But, but Saul wasn't down, Mandy wasn't down. So <clears throat> I talked to Mandy and I knew this is gonna be difficult because Mandy is, is likely, you know, feels very strongly about this. And I don't wanna throw, a and not that he wouldn't be cooperative, he would have wanted to do it, but I didn't wanna throw a wrench into his performance. I didn't wanna cut him off from his instincts. So I said to Mandy, uh, here's, here's our problem. I understand that what, you, and that's another thing I do when I'm trying to make adjustments, that I want an actor to feel seen. I want them to know that I saw what they were trying to do. There's nothing, I think it's dispiriting to tell an actor, yeah, don't do it that way, do it this way. They may have given a lot of thought to what they did. They have made, and, they're, and, they're, and most of them are not stupid people. And if you don't acknowledge what you saw them do and just say, it doesn't make you right and them wrong, it's just a difference of opinion. So what I'll tend to try to do is say, I see what you were doing, how you were trying to affect your scene partner in this particular way. I'd like, to, I'd like you to think about this in a little different way. And I'd give them different imaginary circumstances, hoping to kind of orient them more towards what the story needs to be. With Mandy, I told him, I said, you know, here's our problem. It's very justified what you did for Saul's behavior, but it's not the story point. And I told him the story point is, as I just stated, that we've got to feel that Rupert is hitting you when you're down. If you stand up to him with such ferocity that we've always expected from you, uh, you might your rage might outstrip his. And we wouldn't get that feeling. Also, with Carrie coming in, it's going to render that whole thing differently motivated. It's going to be confusing. And I saw he understood, oh, that's the story. And it's interesting to me also that it's not the actor's responsibility to know how their choices are affecting other storylines or other characters. That's your responsibility as a director. But then what has to happen is 
you need to find a solution that upholds the integrity of all the characters. You can't then ask somebody to play play it falsely for your character just so this happens. Well, that's not good directing. You've got to be imaginative enough to find a way to suggest a way that they can identify, oh, I see, that would be a legitimate choice too. So I told Mandy this. I said, you know, as near as I can recall, by season four, we had never seen Mandy filled with any kind of serious self-doubt or doubt in his own powers or his own you know, uh, fierceness. And I said, you know, I think what would be very moving here would be if, you, if you're willing to go to a place of deep, deep depression, like a real dark night of the soul, if you really can take in that your inattention led to a slaughter of 37 human beings and the loss of all of the American contacts, undercover contacts throughout Pakistan. If you can not forgive yourself for that, if you can just be constantly punishing yourself internally for it, that you don't have the fight at this point to oppose him. That would do several things. It would make his relentless attack on you a very different matter and it would highlight what's happening within Rupert's character. So if you're willing to consider the scene that way, I think, I think we've got it. And he took it in and he understood it. And because I think he understood the story, he was able to adjust his own performance. And what's so fascinating to me is when you deal with really wonderful actors and you appeal to them this way, they become collaborators and can enrich your thoughts, your ideas beyond whatever you, you might have thought of. And then in a later scene, because of this particular note he had taken in, he found the most poetically beautiful way to play a scene. He was taking a shower and he just, water pounding down on him, he just chose, he just chose to just stare right down at the floor as water is hitting him. And it's like, you know, it was so beautiful and so poetic and I knew Mandy had taken it in and, and accessed his incredible resources to really find the depth of, uh, the depth of a scene. So, as you said, letting them feel seen, knowing mm -hmm. that you that you saw them, that you saw yeah. what they were trying to do, yeah. and it wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Right. But how about we try this? And is this something that this is always done in private, or does time not allow for that? Yeah. Well, no. That is something one has to be sensitive to. You don't want an actor to feel shown up. But generally, I'm hoping. Yeah, and I'll try to, of course, give notes whenever I can, sotto voce or in private. But sometimes my note giving is actually giving a note to another actor who's hearing it. So sometimes it's like I want it to be public because I want everybody in the scene. To, I might take it as an opportunity to define what the scene's about. And I know that it might, good actors are kind of hearing that, they might play into that. That's again, enlisting their cooperation, enlisting their talent to, they might find other wrinkles in the way they're gonna do. So, some, so often I like giving a note publicly because I'm really addressing everybody. I'm talking about bigger issues. So, so that's, that's one thing. But I will say there are times when uh, it's, it's a little concerning giving a note, especially when you're dealing with like an intimidating actor. And I had one story, again, I relate in the book, that... Uh, Do you want to just show us your book? Sure. It's got a beautiful cover. Thank you very Love much. Love to look at that. Yeah. It's uh, directing great television inside TV's new golden age. Excellent. Um, there was an instance where I took a job on a show which will remain nameless, not because I think the actor would really mind the story I'm gonna tell, but I just wanna be cautious on it. Sure. But he was an actor, a very famous actor, and I, I took the job primarily to work with him. I thought, oh my goodness, I, I, you know, he's, he's, I've been blown away by his performances and so many things. <clears throat> and uh, when I was prepping, another thing I'll do with actors is, is I, try to avoid a situation where I'm showing up on set to direct them, never having met them. Because it's like, that's, that's one of the really interesting uh, challenges of directing series television is you're the one temporary person and yet you're in command. You're coming in and leading and being the final arbiter and when the performance is good enough to say cut, move on, and they may not even know you or know anything about you or know, you know, it's like, how can I trust this person? Do I know they even have a grasp of the show? You know, so I try never to, uh, it doesn't always work. Sometimes you can't meet everybody before, but I try and prep to go introduce myself, maybe talk a little bit about the script if, it, if they're lead characters, try to acquaint them with the fact that I know that I've seen the show and talk about what I've admired about them and all that. And I'll also say while on this subject, 
often when I'm giving notes to actors on show new, or shows where I'm new and they don't really know me, I'll try to couch my adjustments by referencing other shows, other of their performances. So they see, I say, you know, this moment is interesting. It reminds me a little bit about, you know that moment in season two where you had that scene with so-and-so? There's a lot of similarities to that in this, this moment here where, you know, your intention there was more this kind of thing. I think that's kind of more what's at play here than, you know, necessarily trying to do this other thing. But, but a difference is, and you know, so, so suddenly they're hearing me, oh, oh, they've watched both shows. Oh, I get, okay. I think it can build trust. But uh, in this instance, I went to uh, introduce myself to this lead actor. I'll call him, I call him in the book, I call him Max. So I'll just say his name is Max. And uh, I went up to him and I just, it was one of those things where you're talking to kind of a, you know, an, uh, someone who's kind of a acting hero of yours. And you, you know, he's, and I said, oh, I really am looking forward to working to you and all that. And as I'm talking to him, he had this manner of this kind of preternatural calm. He was just so self-possessed, so unaffected by anything I was saying. He just was looking at me. And I felt like I felt like I was being looked through, you know? And I felt like, what am I doing here? I'm trying to impress somebody, or it's like he's he's not impressed and he didn't it was very unforthcoming. He was polite, but you know. So I left, it was one of those instances where you think, oh my God, what did I say? It wasn't that, oh my God, that was stupid. You know, so I didn't feel the comfort you hope to get when you introducing yourself. And uh, so I went through my prep and then the first scene we had together was uh, this scene I was really looking forward to him doing because I'm always gonna kill this, it's gonna be great. And uh, we rehearse it and uh, he comes in and he gives the most tepid, uninteresting performance imaginable. Worse, it was boring. And I'm just watching this, what? <laughs> and I think to myself, okay, just remember this is just a run through, this is a rehearsal. Maybe his process is not to act at the beginning. You know, maybe it's okay. And I don't wanna be a, you know, come to him and say, Max, I think he's, what are you talking about? I wasn't. What are you judging me for? It wasn't my performance. I didn't want that, right? So I said, I'm gonna just wait and we'll shoot it and then I'll see what he brings. So we light the master and we get ready, we call everybody, we do the master angle. He comes in, does it the same way. So now I'm thinking, oh boy, all right. So now my first scene with this guy, I have to go to him and completely tell him his instincts are completely off from what I want. And I'm thinking, and I also not sure what he thinks about me, you know? <laughs> and. Uh, so I'm thinking, okay, what can I do now? <clears throat> so I think hard, long and hard about it. And for, for the viewers to understand the note I gave him, I have to just tell you a little bit about the scene. Max's character was the leader of uh, a band of renegades, thieves. It wasn't James Gandolfini, this is not The Sopranos. And, uh, and he's a fierce, ruthless character. And uh, the person he's coming in to see is someone, and he has his own community of thieves. They have a, like a, their own world. Uh, and the person he is coming in to see is someone who had an aristocratic background, who had to flee because he was at his own trouble and had sought refuge with Max's world and has been there now for several years. And uh, what he's tasked, what the, the other guy is tasked with doing is fixing a piece of machinery that Max needs fixed to accomplish his grand criminal scheme. He, this has to be repaired for him to be able to do this thing. And he comes into the scene and he says, how is it going? And the other guy who also is sickly, so he's not very well, but he says, this is really, I don't know if I can fix this, it's really difficult. And Max then begins to spin the tale of their history. And he says, you know, when you first came here, I thought you were you know, an aristocratic man who really looked down on people like us, you know, rough hewn men who kind of brought ourselves up by our own bootstraps and all that. And he goes on a little more. He says, but as the years have gone by, you know, I've, I've seen that, you know, you've, uh, you've assisted us and all that. And I really hope that you'll, you know, work harder to get this done. That was paraphrased of what happens. And what Max had done is he had taken the surface level of the dialogue, literally, and he played it very docilely, respectfully, and come in and said all this thing, very, you know, 
nicely and inviting him to really work harder. And I went to Max and I said, okay, I said, um, I wonder if I could ask you to think about this scene a little differently. Um, the contempt you describe having felt for him when he first arrived, I'd like you still to be feeling exactly the same thing. All the, I didn't say anything more than that, but the, anyway, so I'll say, so he just looked at me and said, very well. And I go back to, the, <laughs> to watch it and we say action. As soon as he comes in, there was just an electric vibration. It was chilling. It was terrifying. He came in and he started to talk to this guy. How is it coming? And then he starts to tell the tale of their history. And what you understood in the subtext is, I thought you were an entitled asshole then. And I still think that. And just because we've existed, coexisted, because there's been mutual benefit, if that mutual benefit should ever end, your life isn't worth a cent. And that was this, I mean, this intensity he had, it was just terrifying. He was always just toying with him and talking about it, you know. And it was everything I thought the scene should be. It was just electrifying. It was fantastic, you know. So <laughs> we cut and we move on and we, you know, play the scene. No, nothing more from, Ma from Max. I do that, Max, that was great, thank you, whatever. And, uh, and so a few days later, I'm in the, uh, I, do, I do my laundry at the, at the costumers, the wardrobe trailer where they clean their clothes. There's washing machines. I bring mine in and I throw it in. And the head costumer approaches me and said, hey, I was talking to you about, uh, I was talking about you with Max. And immediately I'm a little alert because I'm thinking, I have no idea if he agreed with my note or what he thinks about me or anything. So I said, hey. and she said, yeah, he says he loves working with you. You're the first director to give him a note. And I just realized that, you know, other directors, great, direct, great actors might rarely need notes, but sometimes they do. And if you're the storyteller, they almost always will, will benefit from shadings or something to kind of, you know, point them more. But I think his, his presence was so intimidating to some directors, they just felt, I'm, that's above my pay grade. I actually heard one director actually said that. And that's irresponsible. It's tough, but you gotta be willing to stand up for what you think the story point is and find ways to do it that, you know, and take a risk, you know, maybe someone you really admire is going to be really unhappy with you and yell at you. But, you know, that's the buck stops with you. What made Snowfall season three, episode one, a challenge for you? Well, what was most challenging about it was how big it was, meaning how many huge sequences were scripted. You know, a season premiere episode is, needs to be exciting. It needs to pack a lot in to kind of sustain audiences' interest to come back for future episodes. And, and in season three, uh, it was one of the most, this, this was a, a show, in case your viewers don't know about it, which dealt with the uh, crack cocaine epidemic in the early 80s in South Central Los Angeles. And uh, there was so much packed into this uh, particular episode. There were stunt sequences, there were aerial sequences, there was uh, deep interpersonal things going on. And uh, so whenever I'm given a script to read uh, or that I'm going to direct, I try to read it at first, n putting aside all those considerations. You know, I'll try to first, because, I, I, you know, one of the, challenges I had transitioning from being an assistant director uh, to becoming a director is to stop being an assistant director, to stop looking at uh, uh, something in terms of the difficulty to do it, but instead to look at how this story is affecting me, how might I tell the most exciting, wonderful story, exploring all of its depths uh, you know, as possible, uh, and let myself dream about it. Um, and so I'll read a script just letting it wash over me and seeing what interests me, determining what is it really about, what, what am I drawn to in the characters, uh, because I can't really know how difficult it is to shoot it within the time and budget constraints until I figure out what story I'm telling, where I want the emphasis to be, how I'm gonna do certain things. Some things that read difficult as, as being difficult might be shot very simply. Some things that seem simple might be very, very complicated to shoot. So, uh, 
in this particular instance, there was no getting around that this was just a, a bear of a show. I, you know, I, in my book, I do have a chapter on oh, this. Oh, great, Let thank me you. See. I, I think I summarize in it. Um, here's the book. I, oh, think, I think I summarize in it what the issues were, what the sequences were. Let's see. Um, when I was hired to direct the opening episode of the third season of the FX show Snowfall, I was presented with a script that included an ambitious opening stunt sequence on the streets of South Central LA, as well as a sprawling nighttime shootout, a shocking murder of one of the recurring characters, a bar fight, an aerial stunt sequence culminating in a crash landing on a Mexican airstrip, a grand opening celebration, the rekindling of a, romantic, of a romance between two lead characters, a lengthy nighttime driving sequence ending in a nightmarish reveal of a crack house, plus many other highly charged sequences. It was a well-written, densely packed script, and it promised to be a great kickoff to the season, but it was huge. So Snowfall <laughs> was on, is on the FX network, and that's a basic cable channel. It's not, you know, the budget of Snowfall is nothing like things like Game of Thrones or The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, where the production values are opulent. So, you know, as, as a director coming in any show, you have to accept the givens, what the limitations are, and the budget is one of the significant ones. But each show, including Snowfall, is aspiring for the same number of viewers. You want it, you know, you want it to, to make it as compelling as possible. So I did have to prep, in order to figure out how much we could do, I had to prep all of the various sequences. And you work in, in conjunction with the assistant director who's scheduling the show as you're going. And you try to find out, originally what I, what I initially what I try to do is get a sense of what would it take to shoot this episode? Not like if you have an eight day schedule, how do we fit this into eight days? No, I'd like a realistic estimate of how many 12 hour days would we need to shoot this entire script? And some assistant directors are reluctant to do that because they feel their bosses are wanting them, you know, to say, no, no, say we can all do it. But, you know, you don't want to be put in a situation where you can't succeed. You don't want to be put in a position to fail. So the show is the show. It's a high quality show. So I know everybody wants it to be good. You're not going to be able to do it badly. So to do it up to the standards of the show and up to my own standards, what would it take? And it might take, well, to do all of that, it's going to be 12 days. Well, okay, we don't have 12 days. Or I could then go to the producer and say, can you give me four more days to shoot? And they'll say no. And then we'll say, okay, uh, in this case, they had given me actually an extra day because they knew it was big. So it's a nine day schedule but it couldn't be done in the nine days. And uh, so then my job as a director is, uh, it's easy to say what can't be done. The real challenge and what distinguishes one director from another is how much of a script's real value and merit can you, can you realize within the limitations? You know, how can you, how can you find other ways, as they, say, as they say, to skin the cat? So the best way for me through that is, A, focus always on story, uh, be as prepared as I can be and and see what what time savers I can create that can allow us to do a little bit more maybe than what you originally thought. So in this instance, uh, in the chapter I write about in my book, I focus on only one of the sequences, but it should be noted that this had, I was prepping all of the sequences simultaneously because you only have the eight days to prep before you start shooting. And uh, this one sequence was very complicated and it was the opening stunt sequence. So in this opening scene, uh, this was the transition from season two to season three and what the writers wanted to show was the effect that the crack trade was beginning to have on the community of South Central Los Angeles. So they wanted, we wanted to see a transition from the previous season. And the, uh, main character of this opening teaser, this opening stunt sequence, is a police officer uh, who happens to be the father of a young woman who is the girlfriend of the drug dealing protagonist of the series. I, I guess you would call him an anti-hero because he's doing some pretty bad stuff. So he's got this internal family issue that his daughter is, is uh, is, uh, is lovers with this drug dealer. And uh, he's also committed to preserving his community. So what the, what the scene dramatizes is you start with him patrolling South Central. 
and he's seeing that there's signs of a change. You see young men on the corners wearing gold chains. You see others driving cars that they didn't used to be able to afford. And as he drives, uh, continues to drive, he sees a car stopped in the middle of the street and a drug trade, a drug deal going down. And there's a dealer in the car and there's a young woman crack addict who's leaning in the car window trying to buy dope. So he pulls his car over, walks towards the uh, car, and the dealer sees him approach and quickly tries to end the deal and says to the woman, get out of here. But another way to show the, uh, the way this drug has taken hold of the community, these, the addicts of crack are, are, are so dependent on it that she's, she can't take no for an answer. So as he starts to pull away, she jumps in the car window, the open car window with half her body outside, legs flailing, reaching for the dope. As he's tearing off, the policeman goes back to his car, tears off, this is what's written, tears off after him. After they go a certain uh, distance, the woman grabs some crack off the seat, falls off the car, collapses in an unconscious heap. The policeman comes up to her and he's thinking she may be dead for all she, he knows. He gets out of the car, he comes towards her and just as he's about to reach down to her, she leaps up and tears off and is again, meant to, well, whatever, that she's got this, she's energized by this crazy drug and she wants to get high and she's, she's running away. At, again, what's scripted, she runs off and she, she goes by a car parked somewhere and she tears off its antenna as she's going and she stuffs, as she's running, she stuffs the crack into the antenna. I should say that was a note, John Singleton, who was, uh, who, who lived this story, I mean, in South Central and not that he was a crack addict, but he, he, cre he was one of the creators of the show and, and he had, he'd always wanted to get this note in because he thought that was kind of a cool thing that he had actually seen someone taking an antenna and making a crack pipe out of it. So she continues to run, crack, you know. He, the policeman, gives chase and loses her. And when he finally sees in the corner, we see her with inhaling from the antenna pipe, blissfully looking at him, content for him to take her anywhere he wants. And the, the end of the teaser is meant is that he sees her and is aware this drug is trouble. This could ruin us. If this woman could go to these lengths, we're all in serious trouble. All right, that was the scene. Huge stunt sequence to do, to do safely and to do well and to cover a lot of terrain and all that kind of stuff. So while I'm prepping the episode, and, but it was also the kicker to lead into the season, so I really wanted to deliver an exciting sequence. Um, so uh, some of my considerations were these. Well, first of all, while we're prepping this, we're prepping everything else too. So we're seeing how much time do we need to do that? And it felt to me like it was a couple of days work to do this because it was also in the height of winter. So we had about nine hours of daylight and uh, there's lunch in between. So to do all of that car stuff, to do a dangerous stunt, to do traveling big areas, to do running through you know backyards and all that stuff, you know, that's, that's hugely time consuming, probably not doable in, in, I mean, two days would be a challenge to do it. And we didn't have time for that. So we're trying to figure out, okay, for the aerial flight sequence, we need this, for that, we need this, for the nighttime thing, we need this. And it was just obviously seeming very big. So the first thing, and I was talking to the showrunner about, okay, he was interested in how I was doing because he wanted as much in it as he could. And I said, well, look, first let's think story here. Um, this is a priority, this, this stunt sequence, obviously. Um, some of these other things we don't have time for. I don't think we have time for this aerial sequence because first of all, it's very difficult to shoot that. And secondly, it's not terribly important story-wise. It's just what it dramatizes is a pretty minor story point. It gooses it, it makes it kind of exciting, but the story totally gets told without that. So we, we decided early on, okay, we'll get rid of that. But we still had far too much to do. But finally, we nipped and tucked and we did all that stuff until we got to the point where we think we can, I think I can make just about everything else work. But the thing is, we have to figure out a way to do this done in one day. I can't, we can't have more than one day to do it. And then that became its own challenge. Okay, how can I possibly do this? Now, in trying to uh, give the opening sequence the magic I really wanted it to have, uh, the first two seasons, the, the pilot episode of the show had a beautiful uh, opening shot, which was shot with an airborne drone. And it was, you know, in South Central LA, 
there are, the, there are a few streets that are, have these enormous, beautiful, thin, statuesque palm trees that line the street. And this particular opening shot of the whole series from the first season was a beautiful shot that started on the street and then it rose up and it rose up and it revealed these incredible, you know, uh, trees that kind of presided over the life, the lives of everybody below. And I wanted to invoke that to, you know, to say, okay, that was season one. Now we're in the same place, season three, and what's different? So I thought, okay, first we need to find a street that has these because there weren't that many that have those that have those trees and also it has to be appropriate for the period which was 1984 so if you know if there were a, you know inappropriate architecture we couldn't shoot there we were able to find about two blocks that were really good weren't the only two blocks but they were they were pretty good and they were two blocks but what was written was much more than two blocks first of all you have the guy the policeman circling the whole community, driving through it, establishing other things, coming to another area, seeing this drug deal, parking his car on a side street, coming over to them, the car taking off, him going back to his car, racing God knows how many blocks, uh, and, and, and all that. So we said, okay, well, that's going to be a challenge. And I also was struck by the story challenge of, um, well, I started, I said, okay, Maybe what we could do is if we use these two blocks and I can be inventive with my angles, we can shoot them as if there are many more blocks by changing our angles, having the car come in at different places. And so we made a plan to do that. Then uh, the most important, the biggest challenge was how to do this very dangerous stunt safely. I mean, you know, the stunt like that is exciting because it's life-threatening to see somebody hanging out of the car like that. And, you know, obviously we have to make it safe for the stunt performers. So how do we do that? So I had, to, I had to work with the stunt coordinator and the cameraman and we worked out kind of a way to shoot it and a way to uh, bolt her into, the, have her connected to the car. When we see the car from the outside, she's, she's not really, uh, she has something to hang on to, but she also has to jettison from the car too, so it can't be a belt. So it was really, a, I was very concerned about doing it safely. Um, and, we, and we figured out several things. One, we figured that, uh, uh, I also needed, I said, I realized I need a close-up of her falling away from the car as well as a shot from outside of the car of her falling off uh, for a reason I'll talk about in just a moment. But what that pointed me to was that I needed a stunt woman to be able to play the part because I was going to be on her close-up as she's trying to get the, the drugs and then her falling away onto the street. Uh, so we had to find stunt people that could possibly pull it off and we fortunately did. And I realized when we had her as a stunt person, I said, well, maybe if the stunt, if the dealer could also be a stunt man, but there was, there was real acting involved. So I had to audition several stunt people until we found two people that we thought could do it. But that created a real time saver in that we didn't have to tow the car ever. It could be free driven. The stunt man could always drive the car himself and uh, we wouldn't have to put a car, connect it to another insert car, camera car and tow it. That's a big time drain would have meant we couldn't do that couldn't do the show, couldn't do the scene in its full way. So we had saved time that way. Then I started to think about other issues. It's like, now how does a, this whole thing of her running away, how, how, how does a physically fit cop uh, lose someone running away who's right there with her? She starts running, she breaks off this thing, she does all this stuff, he's giving chase. How does, he, how does she get enough distance to, to lose him? That didn't make much sense to me. I mean, it, it can be done, but it just, you know, it, it would have felt to me like a big cheat. So I suggested, well, why don't we, instead of having the cop go back to his car and give chase, what if he just runs after the car that's going off and, and then she'll fall off after one block, which will <clears throat> shorten the amount of terrain we have to cover. and will also make him winded when he gets there, which might justify him not being able to give chase. So that also... It uh, enabled us to have to do a whole company move to shoot the end of the car chase. It would just be right on our same two blocks. All right, we did that. Um, it's, it's really <laughs> an epic story. I, I hope uh, people are still following me, but everything that goes into these scenes you see, it's like, it's, uh, I think some viewers sometimes just watch a show as if, oh yeah, that happened. And you don't realize how many choices go into every sequence you watch and how many decisions are being made to uh, present the scene in exactly the way you see it because everything is a choice. In any case, uh, we started working on it 
more and I realized, okay, this still isn't working. And I realized the thing in terms of the time, we still can't do this in one day. And I realized the bridge too far was this second chase. And I went to, I went to the showrunner and I asked him, what are, tell me about, which is something I all like to do a great deal of is to really confer with the writers a lot to find out everything they had in mind. I mean, I'll have my own take on the material and I'll try to bring my own values and, and resources to bear, but I really want to, I'm really assisted by hearing from the writers what exactly was in their mind. What, what is the subtext? What did they really, whose point of view is the scene? What were you really working on? And the writer, the showrunner, a guy named Dave Andron, very talented, was saying, well, uh, I really want to show the depths to which these crack addicts will go to get their fix. And, also, and that's really why all this stuff is happening. And I thought, okay, so that's, that's what we want to show. And I thought, do we really need, because the thing that was adding to the time was her springing up and running through backyards and back alleys and him running and imagining getting the camera and also having to do tight insert shots of what she's doing while she's running, namely packing the pipe. It just would be a real, real challenge to do quickly. And I thought, you know, maybe there's a way that everything can happen at the first stop. But how can we make it deliver that same sense? And so I came up with this idea, which I pitched to Dave. I said, what if she falls, falls and uh, rolls behind a car so that only her back legs are visible to the policeman running up to her and those back legs are inert, aren't moving. So we think, is she dead? Is she unconscious? And when he gets up to her, she can turn to him. We didn't see her loading the crack pipe and she turns to him exhaling. Oh, she could already have a crack pipe. Why does, she's an addict. Couldn't she just have her own pipe? Why does she have to break off an antenna? And so, you know, you lose a little bit of, you know, interesting color and a note and John Singleton, you know, was sad to see it go, but you know, he got it. And, uh, um, and that she could just simply turn to him when he's expecting to see her, you know, really harmed from this terrible spill, you know, blissfully happy. And then we could rely on his face to tell the whole story. So with some reluctance, Dave, the showrunner said, okay, I get it. All right. So now we had a plan. If everything went perfectly, we might be able to get this all in one day. Uh, but I also needed, in addition to that stunt, I needed to shoot everything that preceded it. And I wanted an elegiac kind of, what's the right word, elegiac, I don't know, opening shot that would recall that. So it's like, as, as he's going through the neighborhood, I wanted a shot that somehow would see these tall palm trees and all that. And I thought, well, should we mimic the drone shot that was in the first episode? But I thought better of that because I thought that's not the story. The story is, I mean, I want to evoke the, that episode, but the story here is the policeman's point of view of what's happening to his community. So what I elected to do instead was to start with a camera mounted on the roof of the, tall, of the cop car, looking up, and we don't know where we are, traveling down the street, seeing these palms go by, and then tilt down and end over the light bar of the police car. So it would, so that then, then we'd cut inside and we understand we were in the point of view of the policeman. So we would evoke those palm trees in that world, but we'd establish what the story is, which is this, this, this man's point of view. So all of these things I'm collecting and all that and trying to figure out how we're going to get done. And I it worked out with the cameraman, efficient ways to shoot, uh, you know, shooting. And, and one way that we realized we could do that was what you call chasing the backlight, always shooting into the sun so that you're going to get nice lighting so that we'd start, you know, shooting directionally one way instead of, you know, when you're not shooting in the backlight, sometimes uh, directors of photography need to artificially create that, which means lighting. And the, the sun is the best backlight you can use and it's also the quickest, I'm trying to minimize how much lighting we used. Anyway, so after we figured all this work that how the stunt could be done safely and all that stuff, we're ready to shoot. And I did a shot list. And when I showed up on the day of shooting, my assistant director said, you know, I've done a timing and I think we're only going to get through about two thirds of the shots before we lose the light. So I heard him and I said, okay, but I, I, did, I wasn't convinced, but I was concerned. And I just said, well, let's, let's stick with the plan and let's go. And I just made sure to move on as soon as I had what I needed, not get perfection, but get what we needed. And I probably barked a little more than usual to make sure everybody was anticipating, okay, what's up next? What's up next? We also got two identical period cars, 1984 cars, so that we could rig, uh, which isn't easy when you're dealing with period cars, so that we could rig the interior, the shot, the, the, 
uh, shots that were required to be inside the car on the characters, we could rig lights on it and keep another car free of any of those lights so that we could just jump from one to another when we're shooting outside the car and see the car go by. We did all those kind of things you do and experienced crews knows, knows to do and you accomplish that in prep. So we started shooting and uh, it was going very well and we got, you know, we got deep into the stunt and everything was kind of working nicely. And uh, then we got to the point where we had to do the, the young woman's hurtling off the car. And uh, as I mentioned before, it was kind of critical where she landed because she needed to land behind half wheel, half her legs out visible and half in front. And I realized how difficult that is. The stuntman was the stunt coordinator, an excellent stunt coordinator, but as some stunt coordinators do, they can sometimes overestimate what their people can do. And he said, oh, she's going to be able to hit that. And I kind of, okay. And we started doing the fall, the shot of the car going by and her hurtling herself off of it. So the car was meant to look like it was going very fast because he was trying to avoid the policeman. And he couldn't go that fast because she was going to have to time her jump. And it was also not as safe if he needed to slow down a little bit. So I did what we call under crank the camera so that it would look a little faster and it would make her, her fall look a little more herky jerky and more dangerous too. And we shot the scene, shot the shot, and uh, the first take just didn't work. She just, it didn't work. She just fell completely wrong and it's okay, take one, no good. Let's do another one. And the second one we did, and she did a great fall. Problem is she didn't land anywhere near the, behind the car. And I'm sitting here thinking with the sun getting lower and all of us, you know, banking on finishing this day and aware of how much work had still to be done, including the, the opening shot of the sequence, which we're going to wait till the sun was at its lowest to get a beautiful backlight for this other thing. I knew I had to get to that too. I thought, I can't ask this stunt woman to do this again. She, she really did a great job at, at skidding across a pavement, you know, with, even if you're wearing pads, it's got to be painful. And a lot of injuries can happen when you do unnecessary additional takes of stunts. So I said, you know what, at least she had landed with her, uh, facing away from the policeman. So I said, you know what? I'll figure something out. Let's just say it's fine. And we started to move on. And, uh, and then I did a shot of uh, over the inert body, a steady cam to get some energy to tie them together as the policeman's running towards her. I go past her and meet the policeman coming up. And I told her on the ground, I said, don't move until I tell you that we're past you because I don't want to tip that you're still alive. And we did that. And then I did a shot over the charging policeman towards her. And I told her, wait till I cue you to turn around because I wanted him to get closer to her. And the first take we did, she thought she heard my cue too early. And as he starts to run, she starts to make some movement. And I said, okay, wait, I, that, that was a miscue. You didn't hear, that wasn't really me. Let's do it again. And she did it how I wanted her to do it. So we finished the sequence. I'll talk about that later, but I'll jump to this. That night I was, after the day it completed, I thought successfully, I bolted up in bed because I realized, oh my God, I made a terrible mistake. I, if she hasn't moved at all until he gets there, there's no way she could turn to him and exhale this pipe. How would she have lit it? How would that have happened? And I thought, did I blow it? I thought, well, I could do it in cuts, but it would just be a far inferior sequence. You wouldn't get any of the excitement of seeing them all in the frame and all that. And I was beside myself until I remembered the miscue when she turned a little too early. And I thought, okay, it's saved. It won't be exactly as I thought, but I can still have the dynamic shots and an audience will believe when they see her turning with the lit pipe that they'll, they won't be bumped. They'll still be with the story. So a mistake had led to my salvation. So that's the kind of thing you got to be present to what's happening so you can see opportunities that you know you may have missed. Anyway, so we completed the sequence. And I should say too, because it may be of interest to those of you who uh, are interested in editing, that the reason I needed the shot in close-up and the sh of her falling away from the car, which by the way, she fell onto a camera platform on the car. She didn't go on, we didn't want her to hurt herself by doing that unnecessarily. So we had a camera platform below, you couldn't see when she dropped out, she just dropped onto a platform. And the sh uh, joining that to the shot of her, uh, the shot outside, 
She couldn't really create the necessary spring she needed to get all the way across the lane unless she kind of jumped. But that's not what it was supposed to look like. It was supposed to look like she was a rag doll and just had fallen off. But by having the close-up angle of her, I was able to stitch together two shots where I could go from the close-up angle of her falling out of the frame and cut out the false beat of her starting to jump from the exterior shot. So we could just cut to her being a rag doll falling away and rag dolling all the way over. So that was the reason for the need for the, for the two angles of the stunt. In any case, um, I, I, I'm hesitant to go much further. I, I do detail this in the book. We ended the day racing to get the opening sequence, which was a complicated uh, shot as well because it involved timing the background cue. We we're moving down the street, seeing these beautiful trees coming down over the uh, light bar, seeing the street. And I needed a few things to happen that would justify a convertible car, which was a story point going by, that we had a second camera in the passenger seat of the car. So that then panned with the car going by, ending in a profile shot of the cop, which was revealing, okay, it's that guy. <laughs> and this is his scene. And we were racing to get it. The, the, everything was in place, and we, but the sun was sinking. We tried it a couple times, the timing didn't quite work. And we really only had one last chance to get it with optimal lighting conditions, which I really cared about, because it was quite beautiful. And I was sitting in the back seat of the car with the operator with a handheld monitor because the camera angles were up on top of the roof and also in the seat in front of me looking forward. And uh, we had one last shot and we, uh, this is, I love this because it shows you how collaborative and how, many, how, how people bring so many talents to bear to make something great. And uh, we started our trip down the, uh, down the road and we're seeing, and I'm looking at the monitor and you're seeing these beautiful trees going by and I'm thinking, this guy should pan down sooner. He should tilt down. We're going to get to, we're going to miss the cue. We're going to miss the cue. And it, it felt to me too long. And he, he had his own intuition and he kind of tilted down. I cued background action and it was just perfect. And we had this beautiful introduction and we finished it. And it was just uh, one of those great feelings of accomplishment. And it's, you know, it, so that when you get a script that looks challenging and, you know, the, the easiest thing to do is say it can't be done. You know, but what's really great is to is is when you do pull it off by ex and and don't don't resign yourself to telling a story less well. You know, you can still find you know you can still if you really stay fiercely committed to telling the story and getting everything out of it you possibly can. You have you have a real chance often uh, to really pull something off that doesn't look very possible. Can you be a TV director if you don't love story? Mm. I don't think you could be much of a director if you don't love story, because I think that's what the director is, is a storyteller. Uh, I guess people do get into it for different motivations. I mean, it's a glamour position. People, you know, the culture really, you know, lifts up people in the entertainment business. Uh, but I don't think there are too many successful directors who don't come at it with some sort of driving passion to tell stories, and in my case, to understand myself more. It's like I, I feel in, in finding my connection to stories, what moves me about them, what I want to see happen, I'm really exploring myself. I'm really having to look within to find out not what I'd like, how I'd like to be, but how I am, because I'm using myself always as the barometer I mean, the fundamental director question for me is, how does this make me feel? That's something I, I, found, I realized in kind of deconstructing my process when I started mentoring young directors and speaking at festivals, which led ultimately to me writing this book, which I'll mention again oh, cool. at your suggestion, Directing Great Television, Inside TV's New Golden Age. Um, and you just wrote that, sorry to interrupt, but... Just an hour ago. I just no, no, I, 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 yeah, no, I, pub, I, I took advantage of the pandemic because I had to suspend my directing career. And I had started the book uh, several months before, but uh, during the pandemic, I really just devoted myself full time to it. Um, but it's really the fundamental question is how does this make me feel in, in a variety of uh, circumstances? Like, you know, when I'm reading a story, I'm trying to find out when I'm reading a script for the first time. Uh, I'm trying to see how it, how it affects me and what, 
what detail or what storyline or what what grabs me or what nags at me or what bothers me you know i'm trying because all of those things are pointers to something within me that has been evoked and often it's things that it's most exciting for me when it leads to self discovery you know it's not like you know, I think you know if you do something the way it's done been done before, it's just kind of lifeless, you know. And what I'm always trying to find in any story and in any scene is the sense of life, some life happening, which is the first time. It's the illusion of first time, but you know, I think when you get great actors or you create uh, a world, you know, uh, it's it, it grabs the audience when you feel like it's really happening. So when I'm watching a scene, for example, in, re in rehearsal, it's like I'm watching it. I'll, I'll have ideas about what it's about, of course, but I like to see what the actors are going to bring, independent of what I think it's about at first. And I'm constantly asking, you know, how, how am I involved? Am I, you know, I, I monitor myself as I'm watching. Oh, that was exciting, or oh, I'm not very interested. And it's like that's what cues me to where work is needed, or opens me. It's like if an actor does something that startles me, and I see something in a whole new way. That's very exciting, and I want to then go into that and explore that. Why did that move me so much? And why, you know, and how? What other elements in the story maybe I missed? Oh, and there's other resonance, and oh my God, that came into focus. How that that story, that th moment, three scenes later was affected by that, you know. And so, so you know, that's all we really have is ourselves. So, uh, you know, if you don't have, I mean, I'm very grateful that uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to direct. Not just because it's a great job and it's so exhilarating to work with talented people and to and to find you know exhilaration in the feeling of life. It also has taught me so much because often the things I want to see happen are things that uh, lead me to, to to better understand why that is, and it leads me to ultimately to knowing myself a little bit better. You mentioned glamour previously. Um, what would you say to those who want to? do this for the money or the fame or power recognition uh, far be it for me to judge anybody for those motives i mean we all i think you know tr if we're truthful i think if most people are truthful we're all motivated by many many things and it's 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 far beyond my powers in the in this culture to be immune to any of those considerations of course i want to be you know uh well thought of and given status and all those things the thing is those can't be the most important thing. I think it's important, you know, if you become purist and thinks I can't have any of those motives, you're lying to yourself and you're going to be cut off. You know, part of my own, you know, I, uh, what I think is so important about having, frankly, a mindfulness practice, which I do, I've had a meditation practice for many years, but I think that, that being mindful involves accepting, welcoming everything that arises within you and not trying to fix yourself or change yourself or make yourself conform to something but but in this job in directing you know you can't lead with that you can't lead with your ego you can't lead with your desire for to be loved or 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 adulated or anything else you have to, how i think of it is the master we must serve is story is not our ego it's story that's what to me keeps me on focus those other things are there you know but I would hope, and I, you know, I would hope that if my desire to tell a, the best story conflicts somehow with, gee, but I really wanted to do that great 360 degree angle that would be so impressive and people would think of me like I'm Scorsese. But wait a minute, the scene isn't about a dizzying effect. It's about this. You know, I would hope, you know, I always hope I'm going to choose, you know, a serving story, which is also my theory. I have a ch chapter about the language of camera, which. You know, for so many people, is is a real challenge coming into directing. That uh, if you have a literary background or 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 a story background, you might not, you know, be conversant with how images work and how they work on people and all that. And uh, you know, what has been my salvation there, as my teacher there, is again asking, how does this make me feel, and what subjective state do I want to create in the viewer to best prepare them to experience the story, if it's. If it's a magnificent beauty shot, because I want a romantic feeling, I'll do that. If it's, if I want to contextualize a scene between two characters, that they are small in comparison to this environment, I might do a magnificent, you know, put them small in the frame and see a beautiful vista shot. But if it's really more about 
what's this dynamic between these characters? My master may only just be edge to edge with two characters in it. But it's what, again, what story are you telling? Did you start your meditation practice before directing or the other way around? Mm -hmm. uh, well, let's see, I started, uh, no, I would say in earnest, I started it uh, after I started. I mean, I've been doing this for decades, so it's a long time. And, you know, I think we arrive at what we need as we go through life at different times. And often, in my experience has been that, you know, it's taken me often several decades to get to a place of having any kind of wisdom about anything at all. So, you know, I think uh, being able to just settle down and detach from who I take myself, who I took myself to be, who I continue to take myself to be, and understand that that's a structure, that's a construct, that whoever I really am is independent of, uh, of any structure. And that's, that's really one of the things I love about directing is it, an, it, it really requires me to be as present as possible. And to be as present as possible, I find, is to be willing to relinquish our ideas about ourselves, how we're perceived, how we perceive ourselves. You have to just let go of that and be open to what's right in front of you. And how did it help with the composites of shots or, or just the intuition about a scene? Because you've been quiet in your mind now for several years. Oh, so I, my mind is not quiet. Oh, it's not quiet. I gotta okay. say, you know, it's called a pra <laughs> a meditation practice is called a practice because that's what it takes. I see. I mean, you know, it's like, uh, you know, and I want to say, I, I write this in the chapter on interstates. It's like, you know, far be it for me to say, I've never gone through a whole episode at all being completely in my center and no, it's like, no, sure. there's stressors all the time. It's just that you need, it's so helpful to have the ability at some point to just kind of get in touch with, you know, the still center within to just kind of sink down and just what's really important, what's really here. And it's like, you know, sometimes that's all you need, a moment. But I'm, you know, I'm, my God, I'm as, as stressed and, and emotional and get, get hijacked by stuff all the time. But the practice just enables me to be a little more mindful, to catch myself a little more often. And when I'm directing, I have the great advantage of having a story I have to serve. So I, I don't feel, you know, I feel a, a responsibility and an obligation to get present and to put all that other stuff out of the way.